Mr. Stewart, you're ready to go? Yes, Your Worship. Sure. Okay. This is our community's house. We are all guests in it here to serve our community. My name is uh, Mike Little. I'm the mayor for the District of North Vancouver, and I want to welcome everybody here to our regular meeting of council for Monday, February 22nd at 7 o'clock. This meeting is to be held entirely virtually. And so my first piece of business is uh, the council, you have a, a motion inside your, your agenda package, which is uh, a resolution to hold the meeting without the public in attendance. Uh, will one member of council please move, move that motion? Moved by Councillor Murray, second by Councillor Back. Call the question, all those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Uh, the next uh, piece of business we have to deal with is the agenda. Council and agenda has been circulated. Are there any errors or omissions in the agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone move adoption of the agenda? Moved by Councillor Murray, second by Councillor Hanson. I'll call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. We have two sets of minutes that have been circulated around with the agenda package. This is the uh, January 25th regular council meeting minutes and the February 8th regular council meeting minutes. Are there any errors or omissions from those minutes as presented? Hearing none, will someone move adoption of the minutes for those two meetings? So moved. I've got Councillor Forbes followed by Councillor Hanson. Call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. And so those minutes are now adopted. Uh, we also have the release of closed meeting decisions, which is the uh, appointments by the uh, um, Advisory Oversight Committee uh, to North Vancouver Public Art Advisory Committee. That's all in your package under number six. And then I'm going to return to uh, public input. And this is a period of up to 30 minutes that council reserves for opportunities for members of the public to make presentations to the council. Uh, during COVID, we've been doing this via sign up through our clerk's department. And so I have a list of six speakers that have signed up to speak uh, this evening and uh, we will get right to that. Our first speaker this evening is Michelle Sheardown followed by Hazen Colbert. Michelle Sheardown, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You have three minutes to address the council. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, hello, uh, Mayor Little, councillors. My name is Michelle Sheardown, and I am a resident in the district, uh, sorry, excuse me, Inland Valley. And I put my name on the list to speak to item 8.9. And then when I was reading the agenda, I was really happy to see 8.3 about um, the UBCM Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Program. And so I'd just like to say that I'm glad you're looking at that as well. And hopefully with uh, the other North Shore municipalities and with West Van taking the lead on that, that will be something that you can move ahead on. But with respect to 8.9, I'm here to support the recommendation put forward by Councillor Curran. I've um, looked at Help Cities Lead materi their material and I've heard them on a webinar and uh, looked at their website and they're very impressive, supported by a lot of people. And um, their report has been um, prepared thoroughly. These five policy tools that will help uh, municipalities enact um, strong building policy to reduce carbon in the district. Um, they're sound and they've been well researched and put together and I have seen this council get stuff done. I've been pretty impressed with what municipal politics can do, um, but surely having some more tools in your toolbox can only help. So uh, I know that the provincial government has prioritized three of these five policies and the recommendation is asking for you to write in support of those policies and also the remaining two. So the three being mandatory home energy labeling, property assessed clean energy financing or PACE financing, uh, regulating climate pollution for new buildings, which I see you guys doing all the time. It's fantastic. Um, and hopefully building energy benchmarking and regulating climate pollution for 
existing buildings, which is going to be hard. These building retrofits, it's going to be hard work. So any type of um, support and tools that you have, I'm sure will be valuable. So in summary, I encourage all of you to support this recommendation put forward so that the district is well positioned to meet its uh, target set under the community energy emissions plan and uh, that you will contribute, continue to contribute to the global fight against climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Sheardown. Our next speaker is Hazen Colbert, followed by Corey Kloss. Hazen Colbert. Good evening, Mayor Little and Council. I speak to the First Nations resolution on tonight's agenda, which is item 8.8 .8 and is listed as Indigenous Lands. Earlier today, I sent most of you my full input on the matter, including the photos, Facebook references, council meeting minutes, and CBC interview that are relevant to the recommendation I am about to make. In 2015, Councillor Hanson Rosen Chambers declared a potential conflict of interest in the subject of ingress to Deep Cove because his woodlot in Indian Arm can only be accessed by his boat from Deep Cove. In July 2019, he talked in Chambers that there be no perception of conflict of interest. He did so again in 2020. The Indian Arm woodlot he and his family own may be the subject of a land claim by First Nations. Perhaps it already is the subject since local First Nations claim sovereignty over all shoreline from Deep Cove up Indian Arm. In such an instance, good Councillor Hanson might lose his mooring and timber harvesting rights on the land. The harvesting rights, which were recently featured in a news story about orcas off the shore of his woodlot. This is a very sensitive matter in that one that requires the utmost of discretion and full transparency. I trust I am wrong, but in the days of cancel culture, particularly of the canceling of Caucasian cis men of Councillor Hanson's age, might some internet media outlet or the NDP challenge Hanson as seeking to curry favor with local First Nations in order that they provide him a waiver on his mortgage and timber Mr. rights Mr. should the Mr. land Palmer, be. I, can you hold on just for a moment? So I, you're, you're speaking to motivations that nobody could possibly know uh, uh, a person's internal uh, motivations for it. So I'd prefer if you just stick to uh, the your, your, your main concerns rather than trying to interpret yes. what someone might have been thinking. So Mayor Little, that's why I started off by saying I trust I am wrong. Uh, there's no way I can know the functioning of the councillor's mind. Uh, I know Councillor Hanson to be a good and honest person, but cynics might think differently, I don't. So all I will ask that is that given the nature of the land that he owns, and that given he has already declared a conflict of interest in the matter associated with that land, it would seem appropriate that tonight the matter of indigenous rights or indigenous lands, out of the abundance of caution, discretion should rule that matter and the resolution be put in abeyance until all local land claims are settled or if it is important to actually do this with alacrity, perhaps another councillor or maybe staff can just address it independent of Councillor Hanson. That's all I'm asking Mayor Little is that we ensure that there's full transparency here not with respect to Councillor Hanson, full transparency with respect to the land claims that are being made along the shore of Indian Arm, which are, I assure you, because I've tried to read them, extraordinarily complex. Thank you, Mayor Little, and thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Okay, uh, the next speaker I have is Corey Cost. Just wanted to be clear, uh, Dr. Cost, did you wanna speak at the item or did you want to speak at the front end of the meeting? Uh, Mayor Little, I, I think I have the right to respond. Uh, to, to, there was a lot of false information there that I think should be corrected. Uh, Councillor Hanson, you are welcome to make a statement in response. I, I certainly don't own a woodlot and I certainly don't have timber harvesting rights on Indian Arm. I have a summer cabin on Indian Arm, uh, which is held by way of a recreational lease, which my family has held since. Uh, 1959. It is true that I have an interest in land uh, in the vicinity of, of that uh, asserted by uh, the uh, various land claims that intersect the lower mainland, uh, but so do all land owners in and around Metro Vancouver. And uh, to suggest that uh, my motivations were in any way linked to preservation of an interest in land that has been in my family for 59 years 
um, is uh, preposterous and uh, I'm not in a conflict and uh, I will be continuing to assert uh, uh, the motion that is uh, before council tonight. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Dr. Costa, just wanted to check in with you. Did you want to speak at the front end of the meeting or at the item? Uh, at the item, if you could, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I thought that was the case. Okay, so then the next speaker that I have is Lori Parkinson, followed by Judith Brook. Lori Parkinson, can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Mayor Little. I can. Can you hear me? I'm having difficulty hearing you. I see you're unmuted, but I don't know if your microphone is... About that. That's, that there is better, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mayor and Council, for letting me speak. My name is said is Laurie Parkinson, and I live near Moodyville. I'm speaking to item 8.9, District of North Vancouver support for provincial advocacy for climate targets. The world is in a perilous situation. We are experiencing a global climate disruption, which will only get worse. Canada, BC, and the District of North Vancouver declared a climate emergency in 2019. The next step is to change regulations so we can reduce carbon emissions rapidly. We need to have our carbon emissions in 10 years. We need to decarbonize all of society quickly. And that's not all. We need to figure out how to remove a lot of carbon dioxide that's already in our air. So we urgently need to stop producing so much carbon pollution. Where should we start? 41% of the district's carbon emissions come from heating buildings. The BC step code and the district's recent passing of greenhouse gas intensity measures certainly help. Good for you folks for passing these advances. However, much more needs to be done. And I'm sure you're aware of that. Unfortunately, municipalities can't decarbonize in areas they don't have legal jurisdiction over. The BC government holds control of many areas in which municipalities need and want to reduce emissions. Help Cities Lead covers five important areas in which municipalities could reduce emissions from buildings if the BC government would allow you to. I urge the district council to support the Help Cities Lead initiative by writing letters to the listed ministers, Metro Vancouver Regional District, and all BC local governments asking them to support the initiative. This needs to be done for our kids. Please make your decision on this and many other matters through a climate lens. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie Parkinson. Uh, the next speaker is Judith Brook, followed by uh, John Miller. <coughs> Judith Brook, can you hear me? Yes, Mayor Little, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Thank you. Hello, my name is Judith Brook, and I thank you for this opportunity to address council. I live in the 2000 block of Laurelin Drive in the district of North Van. And I'm speaking tonight strongly in favor of agenda item 8.9, uh, District North Van support for provincial advocacy for climate targets. I am so very thankful to our council and applaud your past and continuing efforts in the face of the global climate crisis that the world is facing. Every province and specifically for us focused on British Columbia, we need provincial government to boost the municipality powers and authority to move regulatory measures noted here by the Help Cities Lead Initiative. I also support council sending uh, letters to Metro Vancouver and all the BC local governments to support this as well. If you vote in favor of tonight's motion, I will be writing yet again to provincial ministers in support of this request, and I will encourage the hundreds of Force of Nature supporters here on the North Shore to also show their support. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Judith Brooke. Uh, the next speaker is John Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Clearly, you have uh, three minutes to address council. So I too am lined up on item 8.9 around help cities. 
Oh, no. Mr. Miller, we're, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're having trouble hearing you. Your video is frozen. Could you suggest Mr. Miller turn off his video, Mayor, if, if you're yeah. okay with that? Mr. Miller, uh, sometimes it works a little smoother if you turn your video off for a minute, but uh, his video is not even recovering. So if you can hear me, Mr. Miller, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign your name up back at the agenda item and we'll proceed with the, the council meeting and then. Uh... Am I still on there? Oh, there you go, Mr. Miller, you're back. Okay. Uh, yeah. Why don't you turn off your video that, and, and we can oh. st we'll still be able to hear your audio if you have a yeah, okay. an internet connection. There you go. Okay. You have three minutes to address council. Okay. Uh, so the point is that uh, there is this financial barrier to doing retrofits to existing homes uh, to uh, reduce the greenhouse gases. But the, uh, as everybody's already mentioned, there, there is this uh, help, help cities lead program that includes the property assessed clean energy program. This is something that exists in three other provinces. It isn't here in BC. It's in Alberta, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. And it's in place throughout the US and it's very effective. It allows a homeowner who wants to retrofit to apply to the municipality, an assessment is done, a cost estimate is done. And then the, through provincial legislation, the municipality can provide financing at low, low, low interest, maybe four or 5% to that homeowner who goes ahead and gets the work done and then gets to pay off the, whatever the expense is over 10 years. And the energy savings more than pay for that, that uh, back pay, repayment. So it's a very successful program, but it does require provincial legislation. So I support what the others have said that if for uh, District North Van to join the other municipalities on the North Shore in writing to the provincial government and the other municipalities in support of the Help Cities Lead program. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you, John Miller. Okay, that completes our speakers list. Uh, we do have uh, a speaker signed up to speak at item 8.1, which we'll get to in just a moment. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, uh, reports from council or staff. The first item that we have is the 2021 to 2025 draft financial plan uh, public input. And uh, I think in this case, it may be beneficial to hear the staff report first, and then I'll go to the uh, member of the public that would like to contribute their comments. Through your worship, Mr. Danak will be introducing the topic tonight. Thank you, Mr. Wardell. Mr. Danak. Um, thank you, your worship. Um, tonight is the public's opportunity to speak directly to council on the draft financial plan, the 2021 to 2025 draft financial plan. All feedback received during the public input process, including tonight's, will be summarized for council prior to council's del deliberations meeting next Monday, March 1st. The plan reflects council's priorities and the proposed increases in the lower range in the region while continuing to maintain our public assets in a state of good repair. There will be opportunities to amend the plan for any items not currently reflected uh, later this year. And there will be opportunities uh, at the deliberations meeting on Monday uh, for further discussion. Thank you, Mr. Danilak. So just a reminder to council that this is not an opportunity for council's debate. In fact, at the end of the public input, uh, we just complete the item. There's no motion uh, necessary. And then uh, staff receive that feedback and um, make it part of the ongoing discussion about our financial plan at that point. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to welcome uh, our speaker here. We have uh, Corey Koss signed up to speak to item 8.1. Uh, Corey, I think we, Maybe we'll do uh, just run this as, as uh, our normal public hearing style, uh, if you'd like uh, five minutes and if you would like an additional five minutes. And then after that, it's if uh, there's been no repeats at the discretion of the chair. So, uh, Dr. Cost. Uh, okay, uh, I hope you can see uh, what I sent to mayor and councillor councillors earlier on the screen. I can. Very good. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, really uh, repeat uh, verbatim um, the items that I have uh, uh, 
displayed here. I think uh, for the public's interest, they can always uh, uh, read this material. And so I will just uh, scroll through it. Um, I had um, more questions than this, but um, some of those were answered at the uh, NVCAN uh, get together where the, all the community associations uh, had a, a very open discussion with uh, uh, Rick Danlock from the district. Um, and uh, because I don't want, I didn't want to dominate uh, that particular meeting, I felt it appropriate to bring most of these questions uh, to council at this opportunity. May I interrupt you for just a moment, uh, Dr. Koss? Uh, yes. And I'll pause your time. Uh, so Mr. Danilek, I just wanted to confirm. So uh, Dr. Koss's written submission, that will be accepted as, an, as a full unedited attachment or is staff going to summarize his presentation? Because I'd like to make sure that the full unedited gets adjoined to the report in some form. We can certainly attach the unedited uh, attachment. <laughs> and we will summarize, we'll, look, we'll uh, hone in on Corey, Corey's key points here and we will provide uh, a response for council. I just wanted to make sure you knew, Dr. Koss, that you don't, sc scrolling so people can read it, we're going to make sure that a full copy is included in, in the minutes anyway. That's, that's good. Um, I did have an additional question that's not in here and uh, that's to do with uh, clarifying where, if any, uh, there are budget uh, items in this five slash extended to 10 year plan to address uh, climate change for the next uh, period of time, 10 years. And uh, where is the proposed uh, source of, uh, of funds to, to come from? Um, um, this is sort of now tied with a, a new feature depending on council's decision uh, later on on uh, let's say item 8.9. I don't want to speak too much to that item. It's just a generic question uh, that if you're going to uh, uh, have um, items uh, that force the public uh, to make uh, uh, upgrades to their homes, existing homes, uh, I already sent uh, council uh, some idea of what those costs could be uh, in, in the particular example I sent to council earlier, uh, either today or yesterday, I noted that those costs could be as high as uh, at the full value of my current home, uh, $75,000 up front. Now that's uh, a big cost to absorb unless the district itself somehow uh, has a program for funding uh, these costs to the uh, to the community by way of federal or or provincial grants, uh, in much the same way as the, those uh, jurisdictions have played a role in the, in the uh, funding for COVID uh, nineteen um, difficulties uh, by the communities across Canada. So that's the only additional thing I would hope that would be addressed via some sort of material in the uh, financial plan, because I don't have a financial plan to deal with that. And uh, I was hoping either somebody else is going to pay for that as a community, not just uh, individual homeowners, uh, and that's all I, I think I have to say about uh, the financial plan per se. Um, I, I look forward to having a different financial plan in the future where the core part that you need to display to the public is, is provided in the first section and then a large section of supplementary information that people like myself and possibly I hope others can find all the details they would ever want to look at. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to council directly this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foss.
appreciate your uh, research and and uh, all the extra time you take and attention you take for uh, looking at our budgeting process. I do appreciate it. Okay, council, that is uh, all of the feedback that we have signed up for the budgeting process at this at this point. And so uh, again, uh, there is no follow-up motion at this time. Staff will include the entirety of, of Dr. Cost's comments as an attachment and also summarize them in, in their response uh, as it uh, is appropriate for uh, going forward. Uh, so at uh, this point then, uh, we have completed eight point, uh, item 8.1 and we're going to be moving on to item 8.2. This is the Community Risk Assessment Standards of Cover for 2020 to 2025. And uh, I see our representatives from the fire department are, are coming and joining us. I just wanted to double check, Mr. Stewart, did you have any opening comments on this presentation? Caught him, there you go. Okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna go to the chief, uh, uh, Chief Brian Hutchinson. Uh, welcome and, uh, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, Mayor Little and uh, members of council. I did wanna start off just by expressing our appreciation uh, to be here this evening and to present our community risk assessment standards of cover 2025 to 2020 to 2025. Uh, with me this evening is Assistant Chief Haida Forche. Uh, Haida has been our project lead on this initiative over the past several months. And, uh, and I must say, while we've had a large number of individuals, both from within the fire department and externally, really contribute to the success of this document, uh, Haida has done uh, really a lot of the heavy lifting, and I, I wanted to acknowledge the work that she has done. So, Welcome. Um, Haida is also going to be managing our uh, audio visual this evening. So we do have a very short PowerPoint uh, presentation uh, with a, uh, a video segment internally within it. And uh, Haida will manage that piece for us. And Chief Forche, we're probably um, ready to go. And we will certainly make sure that we've left some time at the end for questions, Your Worship. Thank you. So the Community Risk Assessment Standards of Cover 2020 to 2025 is really for us as an organization building on a foundation uh, that has been in place within the, the District of North Vancouver uh, Fire and Rescue Service for, for many, many years. Uh, we are a, a data-driven organization. Uh, we are committed to evidence-based decision-making. And we seek out and uh, follow industry best practices uh, to our uh, best ability uh, as an entity. And so building on uh, recent work that we have done with our strategic plan and now moving into this uh, community risk assessment is the natural uh, progression for a, a fire department that is looking to really be progressive, proactive and, and lean into the future. Uh, next uh, slide, Haida. So you may wonder why uh, at this point in time uh, to, to get into a community risk assessment standard of cover. Uh, and as uh, you've all seen, we have shared out the executive version of this document in advance of this council presentation. Uh, the full version is approximately 252 pages and goes really into depth uh, in our effort to look at our organization and the services we provide through a much wider lens than I think is, is normal for a lot of fire services. It is really about um, focusing in and emphasizing that, that dedication we have as an organization to excellence in service delivery. It's about supporting and nurturing uh, the, the culture of continuous improvement that is already inherent within this department. It's also about when we take that step back and we look at things through a different lens and provides us an opportunity to qualitatively and quantitatively um, validate 
the service levels that we are uh, delivering out in the community. And that allows us really to provide tangible data, uh, not only for our elected officials, but for those internal stakeholders within the district itself and to our external stakeholders, those agency partners, our, our citizens, the community as a whole. What that really does is it tells everyone who we are, what we do, and why we do it. And that really is, is the essence of what we're trying to communicate and to, to build on the proactive processes that we already have in place uh, as we push forward into, into the future. Next slide. Now I could probably go on at length about our community risk assessment standards of cover. Uh, it is an area that I'm passionate about. I believe it will uh, really um, underpin a lot of the initiatives we're looking to move forward on. Um, but we wanted to actually allow members of our command staff uh, to really share that with you. And with that, we've uh, developed the following video. Sorry about that, having a little technical difficulty here. Let me just try a full share. Welcome to the District of North Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services Community Risk Assessment Standards of Cover 2020 to 2025. So what is a Community Risk Assessment Standard of Cover? Well, this is really about a planning process for us where we gather the data, we analyze it, we prioritize the risks, and we seek to balance our emergency response with our prevention and mitigation efforts in the community. That really means being prepared Chief Fortier, I'm having trouble with the audio. Can you? I know Zoom is is just notoriously bad for video. Is it? Um, yeah, are we is able it, to put a link in the chat and we can all watch it? No. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's Chief Fortier. Your uh, your microphone is muted. Do you have to have your microphone on to get the videos audio? It looks amazing, Chief Hutchinson. Uh, yes, uh, we just need it to actually play. Now, I know that the clerk's office has a copy of the uh, video as well. Uh, we did work with Genevieve earlier to ensure that we uh, had that embedded in the system. So I don't know if uh, Genevieve, if that's an option at this point in time without uh, delaying the process uh, any further. Your, your Worship, I would suggest that the video is not necessary. The report is quite explanatory, and I, I would prefer just to deal with what we can right now. I'm fully supportive of this uh, this uh, initiative, and uh, I, I, you know, uh, applaud the chief for uh, moving it forward. So, yeah, it just looks like you put a lot of work into the video, and I, I wanted to get a chance to that out there. I think. Uh, uh, that's uh, too bad that that hasn't worked out, but we'll make sure that council has access to a link for the video and they can watch it and uh, share their professional critique of your performance at some other time. But uh, the report itself stands on its own. Uh, and so do you have any other comments specific to the report before council starts its discussion? Uh, if I could, Your Worship, I did want to acknowledge, and once everyone does see the video, one of the things that we wanted to note was uh, it was a collaborative effort, and we wanted to especially acknowledge the North Vancouver District Public Library, in particular, the Story Lab video production team. Um, it, this is an initiative that the library has taken on to really um, utilize multimedia to its uh, fullest. And I think, uh, you know, from Marianne Kempthorne, Nick Pearson, Mike Jessup, and other members of the communications team in the district, um, this is a great example of the ongoing collaboration and coordination um, between uh, agencies and interdepartments uh, on the District of North Vancouver on a regular basis. And I think, Haida, we have one more slide 
So just to summarize and, and uh, to, to reinforce, really for us, this is an internal document. It's meant to guide us moving forward into the future. It allowed us to take the time to really thoroughly examine uh, a wide variety of the potential risks in the community, uh, to then contrast that against our current capabilities as a fire department, and then to look externally at those um, benchmarks, those industry best practice targets that we can use to measure our success uh, moving forward. So we, we presented here to you today, uh, happy to take any questions. And I know that we, we do have a motion for uh, uh, approval of this, of this document moving forward as well. Thank you, Chief Hutchinson. Thank you, Chief Forche. I've got uh, Councillor Hanson. Yes, uh, there, thank you very much, uh, Chief Hutchison and uh, Chief Forche. Uh, thank you for the quality of your report. I read the executive uh, version, and I can only, a very high quality uh, document, and I can only imagine all 250 pages uh, proceed on a, a similar um, level of uh, detail and uh, research. I, I, I have a number of questions, but I'd like to start uh, with uh, I suppose what the public might regard as the most basic question, which is um, the, the report uh, proceeds on the uh, premise that you're going to be applying for accreditation through the Centre of Public uh, Safety Excellence. And I guess the question that I would ask is, uh, why is it in the district's interest or what is it that, what is the benefit to us in uh, the, this fire department achieving this accreditation? Councillor Hansen, thank you very much for the question, uh, your worship and members of council. Accreditation is really about uh, international recognition of, of the achievement that we've uh, met as a progressive and proactive fire service. Uh, it's meant to really also demonstrate to the community uh, that we're a, a fire department that continually self-assesses that always looks for opportunities uh, for improvement and is transparent and accountable uh, to the community and is uh, verified and validated by a, a third party entity. And I, I, I have been asked this question before and I, I try and relate it a lot of times to uh, a variety of different professions in the field where people get uh, various credentials. And those credentials they maintain uh, and, and are held to a standard within their industry um, to be able to uh, acknowledge the accomplishments that they have done. It's very similar uh, for, the, for the fire service. It also really allows us to even engage um, more with those other like-minded entities across the world that have chosen to pursue accreditation. And there is where we, we learn even more about innovative approaches, um, industry best pack practices. Um, right now there's about 284 agencies, uh, fire service agencies globally uh, that are accredited. Uh, nine of those are in Canada and they range from large departments such as Ottawa and Toronto uh, to smaller ones like uh, Red Deer, the city of Guelph, and our only BC accredited agency, which is the Township of Langley. Councillor Hansen, I think one of the things that it really does is it's meant to demonstrate to the community that we're an organization that's committed to continuous improvement, and it holds us accountable um, basically to ourselves. Thank you, Councillor. And uh... Thank you. I believe the recommendation, we're just checking on that, the recommendation in the report is to uh, ex, uh, to approve the report. Uh, clerk's just checking in on that matter, but uh, Councillor Hansen, can you, will you be moving, approving the report? Yes, happy to, Your Worship. Thank you. Councillor Kernay is a second speaker. Are you willing to second that motion? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Kern, uh, your comments. Thank you for the presentation. And I just wanted to make sure that um, the folks who worked on the movie know that we're going to watch it all because I know um, I've been exactly where you are, where I've like put all this time and effort into a Zoom presentation movie and then it just, and you're like, come on Zoom. So I feel badly for everyone that did it, but we're definitely gonna all watch it. 
Um, so thank you for that. And thanks to everyone that worked on it. I also just wanted to ask a question. Um, I appreciate, I did read through the report and uh, the vision to be an inclusive and progressive leader that consistently provides our community with excellent service. Um, I think everyone would agree that that's happening. And I just wanted, wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, the work around um, inclusion and diversity. A lot of our partners are doing work in anti-racism and reconciliation um, and certainly getting more women or women identifying um, firefighters uh, on the force. And I know that I'm very proud to have Assistant Chief Porche here. Um, and so I just uh, wondered if you could maybe speak to some of the work that's happening um, on that front in our community as well. Thank you. Sure. Councillor Curran, uh, your worship and councillors. Um, certainly, I, I will say that we try and make uh, every effort that we can to always be engaging with a wide variety of uh, the demographics within our community. Um, our relationship with the, with the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh are growing at a, a phenomenal uh, rate uh, based on people that we have in place. Um, to speak on our, uh, our efforts to encourage gender diversity in the workforce, um, while I'd be happy to, to speak on that, I do have a what I consider a subject matter expert to maybe uh, go through some of uh, what we do have on the go and some of the initiatives, not only that we put in place uh, in, in 2020, but even moving forward into 2021. And I, I do want to especially acknowledge that um, we, and I'm sure Haida will speak on this, but one of the things I was very proud of last year is is we managed to um, host the uh, Camp Ignite program um, when, when many other municipalities in Metro Vancouver were very hesitant and uncertain of how to progress with supporting that program. And the district in North Vancouver is where it landed. And I was extremely proud that we were able to do that. But without further ado, um, Chief Forche, would you like to uh, share some perspective? I'd be happy to. Sorry, it took me a minute there to find my unmute button. Um, you know, I, I, I love so much the work that we've done with this document because it really dives deep when you look at the full version into so many aspects of our community, including equality, diversity, and inclusiveness. And um, I'll be really interested when you get a chance, Councillor Curran, to um, to dig into that big document. And I'd really appreciate some feedback on, on what we included because um, this is a very important topic and um, we've really tried to, to do justice in a mindful way um, to, to reflect on how we want to move forward in the future. We, we've done a lot, um, but we're not really seeing a ton of success at this point um, as far as hiring um, diverse people who would help to build diverse teams for us. But we do things all the time. Um, Camp Ignite, we have been involved with from the beginning. Camp Ignite is in its 10th year. And as Chief Hutchinson pointed out, we supported it last year in a virtual way. And it's, it's too bad the video didn't come through because there is actually a photo from Camp Ignite in there and our training chief talking about the importance of diversity and inclusiveness. Um, just, just a few weeks back, I was honored to be able to sit and virtually share my personal story with um, School District 44. I think there was about 250 students that were on the line for that uh, virtual learning session. And I was able to sit there with Captain Sam Van Born from the city of North Vancouver. We both were able to share our stories and answer questions. Um, we, we do things from large scale events where we bring in groups of people to small scale events where we're approached by um, a school counselor and asked if we would do a work experience day for, for a student. And a lot of the times they are people who are underrepresented in our community. Um, there's all kinds of different things that we do, but I think, you know, in general, just those few highlights and um, Definitely always open to explore all kinds of new items. So if you want to give some feedback, I'd really appreciate that. Well, thank you for that recap. I was aware of some of that work, but I thought other, other people would, would appreciate that. So I really 
Um, I'm sorry I missed that event. I would have liked to have been there, but something that I've heard is how much representation matters. So seeing a woman as an assistant um, uh, chief, I think is really awesome. So, um, and I know that you um, are highly respected in the community, um, the, the organization as a whole. So thanks for everything you do, especially during COVID. Um, and I think something else that was the community might not know is how much of the responses are medical, you know, not fire related and how much of a role you play in the community um, on a, on, in a way that people might not understand. So um, especially in the pandemic, I know it's been extra stressful um, time. So to all the frontline workers pass along our thanks um, for everything that you've contributed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, EMS assist is a big part of the work as well. Councillor Back. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you to Chiefs Hutchinson and Fortier. I really appreciated this uh, this report. I'm always so proud of our fire service, and uh, I was really proud to just read through it and, and read about some of the goals that you have. Um, under the performance improvement goals, I noticed one of the uh, items is to initiate a comprehensive review process for the cooperative uh, fire rescue services with the letter of understanding, the current letter of understanding um, with, has an end term date of uh, December 31st, 2022. Um, this is always an area that I, I, I really admire is how we collaborate across the North Shore with fire services. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, um, for either of you to answer if you anticipate any major changes to that uh, as we approach that date. Councillor Back, uh, your, your Worship Mayor Little and councillors, um, the, the interesting thing is, is as we go through the, the Cooperative Fire Services Agreement that we currently have in place, and I've described it to others as um, we, we've moved so far since it was put in place in 2017 uh, that it is, um, it's bare bones compared to where we are now. And I think the, the, the process for us will be um, just catching this document up uh, to, to where we've went in terms of ensuring that the resources that are in place between uh, Horseshoe Bay and Deep Cove are being used to the fullest extent uh, to, to best serve uh, the citizens of each of the municipalities while supporting the entire population of the North Shore. I'm going to divert for just a second. It was one of the key reasons, Councillor, why I came here. Um, being a resident of the North Shore, but working for an, another fire service in Metro Vancouver, I watched how the shared services, the cooperative services had progressed. And it was knowing that it still was a work in progress, that it still had so far that it could go. It was one of the huge motivators uh, for me to come here because I think it's it's something that's looked at not only in BC and across Canada, uh, but across North America as a model um, for, for where we can go in fire and rescue services. I appreciate uh, your comments on that. Again, it's something I, I really look to. I think it is such a great model. I've got a family member who's a firefighter here on the North Shore as well. And so he experiences it firsthand and it does seem pretty seamless. So it's hard to imagine that it could get better, but the fact that it could is, is, uh, is great news. So thank you. You. Obviously, the document is longer term focused, but uh, I, I'd be curious to uh, have you hear any comments on uh, progress with uh, purples, reds, oranges, and yellows and, uh, and the call outs during COVID. Uh, are there any plans for the provincial government to, uh, to uh, adjust the service levels on those responses in the short term? Your Worship, perhaps I could comment on that. <laughs> Uh, I, I serve on a, a committee that's being uh, organized by the Ministry of Health as a result of the, the Auditor General's report on the interface between fire and uh, medical services. Uh, we've recently uh, restructured that particular committee. Uh, we've got good representation uh, from the BC Fire Chiefs Association, the Lower Mainland Fire Chiefs Association, and we'll be, we'll be focusing on the opportunities to actually clarify that and, and set up, our long-term goal is to set up a system where fire is considered to be an inclusive part of the pre-hospital care continuum. And, um, you know, quite frankly, that's a, a challenge with some areas, but certainly I would say that the Ministry of Health is leading right now, and I'm really appreciative of that, um, and uh, forcing us to, to have some good, good dialogue. And so I'm hope, hopeful to make uh, some good progress this year. Thank you for that, Mr. Stewart. I just, uh, I know I penned uh, a, a letter jointly with several other mayors uh, uh, endorsing 
that the uh, fire department at least has access to the information about calls so they can make operational decisions. And uh, uh, so we have been applying some pressure to the province to, uh, to get that information to you. I have Councillors Hanson, Bond and Kern. Councillor Hanson. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. I have a question for uh, Chief Hutchinson and or Chief Forche, which is a little bit out of the box, but uh, it's one that's been on my mind for some time. And I always, when I see two agencies in some cases with overlap and doing the same thing, I wonder if there aren't uh, better ways to do it from time to time. And I see that I was struck uh, with this when I saw the amount of uh, focus you have on medical call outs. Uh, a medical assistance. And uh, the question that I'd ask is, do you believe it would improve uh, service efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness if the ambulance service and the fire department were integrated into one service? There's an out of, out of the box question for you, Chief. Sure, thank you, Councillor Hanson, uh, your worship, Mary Little and members of council. I am a huge proponent of uh, fire-based EMS systems. Uh, they have worked very well where they've combined services in some jurisdictions. Others uh, still have growing pains. Uh, the reality that we're faced right now is I think, um, and we're very fortunate to have CAO Stewart sitting on that, uh, that committee right now. Right now, our best bet is to enhance the collaboration and the coordination between fire and uh, our uh, pre-hospital care system. I think we can be doing a better service in the community combined, um, but we've got to, right now, it's still the baby steps. Um, we're not quite, we're not quite at the place where we could um, probably integrate in a seamless fashion, but I do believe that one day we, we will get to a point where that relationship is, is solid and that there are no gaps in the service being provided to our citizens, so. Chief. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Thank you. Councillors Bond and Kern. Councillor Bond. Uh, thank you, Mayor Little, and thank you, Chief Hutchinson and Forche, for your presentation. I'm also looking forward to watching the video and hopefully being able to share that on social media so our residents uh, can uh, see all the hard work that was put into that and into this report. Uh, like Councillor Hansen, uh, uh, I did take a thorough read through the report and uh, it is very detailed and very um, complete. Uh, I really appreciate all the work uh, that you and your team have put into this. I think uh, you know, all of our residents and, and visitors to the district uh, are uh, so thankful uh, for the critical service that you and your team provide here in our community. And, uh, you know, I think fire is, is one of those services that the municipality provides uh, that even though it might come in a time of need or, or hardship, it's, uh, it's almost uh, always uh, the interaction is, is, is positive with uh, the members of your service. So I think that's uh, something that our residents uh, take a lot of uh, comfort in uh, and uh, and the the work that you do and your teams do behind the scenes with you know documents like this, with your data-driven approach to uh, your profession, uh, with the accreditation, I think that really um, puts a lot of people at ease uh, and uh, gives us a sense of comfort that we do have a very professional uh, continuously improving and inclusive fire service. So uh, I appreciate uh, the work that's been uh, put into this re report and uh, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Curran. Thanks, just um, there was, a, if, if people are aware, a spill today um, in Kate's uh, Weowichin area um, from a tanker. And I just wondered if um, it was a minor spill, but yet a spill. And I wondered if um, I noticed on the report that you talked about um, some of the chemical hazards that were going to be forthcoming in reports. And I know this is outside the scope of this, but um, we was the fire is the fire department an intervener on the TMX? And um, what is there anything um, like how would the fire department be involved um, in a future spill or would they be? Chief. Councillor Curran, thank you, your, your Worship Mayor Little. 
Um, we are not an intervener. Um, we have uh, obviously left that to the, um, the District of North Vancouver and, and Mayor and Council uh, to provide any, any direction as, as needed. Uh, our ability to provide support should uh, we have something of a nature that's impacting the, the community. Um, we work closely with the uh, City of North Vancouver where we um, really consolidate a lot of our hazardous materials uh, response equipment. Uh, we continuously train to that level uh, and we could certainly, uh, whether it's the um, uh, Coast Guard, whether it's the uh, Vancouver Fireboats, our personnel are fairly interoperable in being able to uh, either access the shoreline or get uh, out on the water with those agencies uh, to be able to provide uh, support and mitigation uh, to the extent that we, the, that we currently can. Thank you. Your Worship, I just want to point out, um, as uh, Chief Hutchinson has mentioned, we do have an agreement with the City of Vancouver. Uh, there was a, a, a uh, structure in place a number of years ago where there were four fireboats distributed in the region. They've now been centralized uh, with the City of Vancouver, and we have a close interface and an agreement with them uh, for them to assist us if we, in, if we should, in fact, have a call or a need uh, for marine uh, fire services. Thank you. Okay, I see no further speakers on this matter. So I'm going to call a question. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Chief Hutchinson. Thank you very much, Chief Fortier. We look forward to the video in full, but uh, thank you for your presentation here today. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item 8.3, the UBCM Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Program. Uh, for the, uh, this is the North Shore application. Mr. Milburn, will you be making some opening comments? Well, thank you, Worship. I, I think another example of a partnership and collaboration on the North Shore. Um, the UBCM Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Program grant application is in a report before you tonight. And Ms. Atva has a brief introduction after which staff would be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Adva. Thank you very much, Mayor Little. Thank you, Mr. Milburn. Good evening, members of Council. Uh, happy to be here again uh, with you tonight to talk about this grant opportunity. This grant opportunity is available through the Union of BC Municipalities, and it's intended to support the province's poverty reduction strategy, but also to support local governments in reducing poverty at the local level. And we know that many of our residents uh, do face challenges due to poverty. Often these are lone parent households, newcomers, immigrants, First Nations, people with disabilities. This proposal is for a North Shore application for $75,000. This project would entail putting together a group of people, we're calling it a poverty reduction task force to help guide the project. This group would be together just for the duration of this project. We know that we have other groups and organizations as well. So we're really conscious of wanting to make sure that this is not duplicating and is uh, uh, providing hands-on uh, local experience. Building on that task force guidance, this project would look at creating a North Shore wide poverty reduction vision with solutions and indicators that would help us to evaluate progress over the proposed 10 year time frame of this action plan. The project would, if funded, would have to be completed with, uh, within one year. This would mean that a draft North Shore Poverty Reduction Strategy would be available in early 2022, so next year. All three municipalities uh, that are proposing to partner, City, West Van and us, require a resolution from their councils in order to submit this application. The recommendations before you are that district staff be directed to work with the city of North Van, the district of West Van, to submit a joint regional application for the North Shore under stream one of the UBCM Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Planning Program for 2021. And that council supports the district of West Van as the primary applicant for this North Shore application to apply for, receive, and manage the grant funding on the districts of North, the District of North on our behalf. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you very much. Members of council, any speakers on this item? Councillor Curran. I, I was just moving the staff recommendation and I'm happy. Thank you. Is there a seconder on the motion? Councillor Back. Go ahead, Councillor Curran. I just wanted to thank staff for working um, with our uh, neighboring municipalities um, to do this important work. I think it aligns with a lot of council priorities as well as the um, in the report it listed the BC provincial priorities for poverty reduction. Um, and I just wondered about the um, if staff is also working with um, Slavitooth and Squamish Nation, um, uh, if, if they'll be involved in this um, process as well if staff could maybe. Thank you very much uh, through you know, your worship to Councillor Kern. Yes, uh, what, what we expect to do and want to do is work, invite the uh, Slaywood and the Squamish to be part of the, the task force, the guiding group to, to help steer this project through over the year. We also have been fortunate, just additional piece of information to um, have had a member of the Squamish Nation support the, the the Social Planning and Research Council's grant as well. We're just getting close to identifying a consultant for that smaller, more far focused piece of work. And the Squamish as a member of the, the broader North Shore Homelessness Task Force has also been supporting that smaller um, project. So yes, yes, in terms of, yes to, to Councillor Kern's question. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I hope we get the grant and um, can do this important work. So thank you, staff. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Back. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Ms. Atva, for the presentation. I, too, am very happy to see that uh, this is a North Shore-wide initiative uh, to look at uh, homelessness. I think it's uh, really important that we do it as a coordinated approach. I just had a question with regards to the actual amount. It's $75,000 that we are applying for and not the $150,000. I just saw that in the report. I wasn't sure. Thank you, through your worship. Yes, the proposed amount to apply for is $75,000. What we know from UBCM that individual applicants are limited to $25,000 each. And while a regional total has a higher amount, uh, through our discussions with UBCM staff and through looking at their application guide, where we know that cost efficiencies are expected, cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness is an important criterion. That, that staff determined in consultation with UBCM that an appropriate amount for the three municipalities would be 70, a $75,000 request. Good, thank you. Yeah, I'm very supportive of this and, uh, and also hope that we get it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I see no other speakers from the council at this time. I'm gonna call the question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary-minded, motion carries. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Etla. The next item up for adoption is item 8.4. This is bylaws uh, 8489, 8490, and 8491, street and traffic bylaw, fees and charges bylaw, and bylaw notice enforcement bylaw amendments for e-bike share. Uh, this matter has already been discussed by council and passed second and third reading, and so it's here for final adoption. Will somebody move a recommendation? Moved by Councillor Bond. Is there a seconder? Councillor Curran. There's no discussion on the motion, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Uh, was that Councillor Forbes, are you opposed or was that in favor? Thank you. So that's uh, unanimous support from council. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is item 8.5. This is the update to public notification signage requirements. I see Mr. Hartford, Mr. Milburn joining us. Mr. Milburn, opening comments. Well, thank you, Worship. Uh, this is an example of uh, standardization and improvement to community engagement notification. Uh, Mr. Hartford is available to uh, provide a brief presentation and, and answer any questions of council. Thank, thank you, Worship. Mr. Hartford. Uh, your Worship and members of council, I just have some introductory comments for the group. Um, there are three components to this evening's item on recommended updates to the district's approach to public notification. 
Um, bylaw 8144 proposes an amendment to the district's existing procedures bylaw, which would outline the statutory requirement for public hearing signs, including the number of signs, their size and location. It would also update the format for public hearing signs with a new sign template as shown in Schedule A to the bylaw. It would add a new requirement that a minimum of one sign on the site must be a bi-directional sign that is viewable from both travel directions on a street. And it would add a new option for additional off-site signs to be installed along arterial roadways for projects that might be located away from an arterial. Secondly, bylaw 8495 proposes an amendment to the district's fees and charges bylaw to reflect changes in the approach to posting required signs. Currently, the district retains a contractor to post signs for public hearings, but development applicants post signs at their own expense to notify the public of events such as public information meetings. To improve consistency in the design and installation of signs, as well as ensuring appropriate placement and visibility, staff are proposing that all signs would be installed by a district sign contractor. The change to the fee bylaw reflects the cost to the district to have the signs produced and installed, a cost that would have previously been paid by the development applicant directly to the sign company. Finally, the district has an existing corporate policy to regulate public consultation that is not required by statute, such as notification to neighbors of subdivision applications and for public information meetings. To ensure that the approach for non-statutory notification is consistent with the amendments to the statutory notification, as noted in the bylaw 8144 changes, sign details such as sign content and the need to be viewable from both direction of travel have been added to the existing policy as an amendment. The two bylaws are recommended for first, second, and third readings this evening, and the corporate policy is recommended for approval by council. Thank you very much. I have uh, uh, Councillors Miri and Forbes signed up to speak first. Councillor Miri, will you be moving a recommendation? Uh, sure. Okay, and, council, and you're moving the staff recommendation, and Councillor Forbes, will you be seconding the staff recommendation? Is that a yes? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Councillor Mary, go ahead. Um, I just have um, some questions. Um, you know, we've, we've had a number of challenges with signs over the years. Um, the last um, example were, were the signs that were placed on the parkway in regards to um, the applicant's preliminary application meeting for Anthem and, um, and then ultimately the uh, public hearing signs. Um, the preliminary uh, application signs were taken up by a massive rendering of what the site um, was going to um, evolve to and um, had information on the sign that you actually had to go park your car and walk up to the sign in order to um, legibly read it. Um, in the public hearing signs, um, the same thing happened again. Um, the public hearing was um, a light blue font was used to indicate the public hearing. Um, it was not visible and uh, the sign, although placed on the corner of um, Lytton and uh, Mount Seymour Parkway was behind a pole. Um, uh, the, uh, the two subsequent signs that were placed on site were mid block and there was no way that you could pull over anywhere on the parkway to read um, the sign. So I'm just wondering um, how I can have assurance that these new signs with the amendments within um, this report, um, you know, that when you're making up a sign on a computer, it may look very clear, but when you, when you replicate it onto a, a, a four by eight or a, a three by eight sheet of coroplast, um, lots of things change. Um, I notice on the, uh, the schedule A, um, development proposal is the most significant part of the sign. Um, I think about a quarter of the page is taken up by a map and I would suggest that the fact that the signs on the property indicates that this is where the application is, you know, um, maybe negating the need for a map to take up another large part of these signs. 
you know, the information that the public needs to see is in big letters. And I think all of us, well, some of us are pretty astute at, um, you know, telling people what's going on, especially during an election or a, uh, a, a movement of, um, you know, considerable um, size. Um, and um, often what happens in these signs is the, inf the fonts are so small that it's, it's not easy to read what is actually happening. So can Mr. Hartford talk to me about the size of the fonts, um, how council can be assured that we can actually read the signs that we're gonna be putting up? And sure. who decides the information that goes on the sign, like the general idea of the application um, and the citing, who, who, who decides that? Uh, Your Worship, Councillor Murray, the District Communications Department has spent quite a lot of time putting together a package of signs that would deal with um, a variety of stages in the development review process. So that could include an early input meeting at the preliminary application stage, a public information meeting, or in the case of the procedures bylaw, Schedule A, um, the public hearing. So we, staff, uh, including the planning department and the communications department have heard concerns in the past about uh, legibility of signs and um, having the right amount of information on the signs. Um, part of the intent of essentially bringing this in house was to build consistency in what types of information are presented on the signs as well as uh, ensuring fonts are consistent and colors. Um, so in terms of sizes of fonts, I don't have the actual font numbers available. Um, the sign formats have been standardized at four feet wide and eight feet tall to be consistent in that regard. Um, but generally the intent is to have fewer words on the sign um, to rely on the newspaper advertising and the flyers that are distributed in the neighborhood, as well as the district's webpage to provide the details. The sign's purpose is really to draw attention to the fact that something is going on at this site and to provide basic information. Yeah, so again, um, you know, when I look at this sign, I, I don't know how this is going to be set up. It looks one way on my iPad when I'm looking at it, but it will look quite another on a four by eight sheet of Coroplast. And this has been the problem over the last 10 years, which has been how long it's taken to actually get this right um, from the placement of signs, um, several behind trees, for example. Um, what triggers more signs on a site? How does that get triggered? Because I know this is a minimum number, but what would trigger additional signs? Um, Your Worship, Councillor Murray, uh, some of it is the, the nature of the property relative to street frontages. If a property is on a corner or if a property has three street frontages, um, the approach would be to require a minimum of one bi-directional sign on each frontage. So on a corner property, that would mean a total of four signs, um, two on each road frontage. If it was away from an arterial, we would require an additional sign, a bi-directional sign located on the arterial. Um, so it's established on a site-by-site -site basis. If we had a very long street frontage um, on um, one side of the property, we would probably require signs at either end of that property. So we try to take into account traffic movements, pedestrian activity, location of um, transit stops, for instance, uh, certainly try to be aware of, of how people can um, pull over to read a sign, but the intent of the signs is not to provide paragraphs of information that people would try to read um, as they're driving by. I, Mr. Hartford, I'm not suggesting paragraphs of information. I'm just suggesting the legibility of the date, the time, the location of the meeting. Um, that, that has been illegible. And um, in the past, um, up to this very most recent um, hearing for Anthem, you were unable to read the signs and it was actually Mayor Little um, that got involved and requested additional signage um, because it was, um, it was you, you weren't able to read any of it. Um, 
so I, I, I'm, I think council needs to be able to understand what this would look like as an example, a real example, instead of a, a, an example in a report, um, to be able to determine how these changes are going to improve our situation. I know during the Anthem public hearing, we did have a minimum sign requirement included in the bylaw. And um, there was one sign placed on the trail at Kirkstone, one sign placed behind a maple tree in the cul-de-sac, no signs placed on Mountain Highway. None. Uh, if I could um, ask to be able to share some images that might help um, address okay, that would be great. Yuri's questions. So um, to the clerk, am I able to share my screen? The interim time, Mr. Bil Milburn, you had a comment. Uh, uh, thank you, Worship. Just wanted to, to point out in the new uh, template format that you see in Schedule A to the bylaw, uh, we show an insert of a location map, but not a rendering or an illustration of the uh, proposed development. That is not included in the package anymore will not be part of the sign notice. A map though is still relevant because um, uh, folks who are interested in the development of the property need to know where the property is situated relative to you know, adjacent streets, especially if we move to the arterial sign format that we're recommending, because when we place a sign that's away from the property itself, people really need to understand how, uh, where it's located in, uh, in relationship uh, to the actual rezoning. And so we still think that's a critical piece of the conversation. Uh, but again, the uh, the rendering or the image, the illustration has been removed, just uh, a map showing the location of the property is retained. Thank you, Worship. Well, for public hearings, we do have maps. And for preliminary applications, we've developers have used renderings in the past when they've been um, determining what the sign looks like. My, my issue with it is the size of the space that we dedicate on the sign to a particular um, part bit of information. For instance, if it's a public hearing sign, I think the letters for public hearing should be the dominant part of the sign uh, with the date and time and location being the dominant part of the sign, um, not development proposal. If it's a preliminary application, it should say preliminary application meeting or, or you know pre-meeting or whatever we wanna call it not development proposal. So you, 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 you differentiate, um, you know, I agree, the, you know, the least amount of writing, but you will, when you, when we replicate these signs, we have big spaces of white area, um, not being utilized by, you know, raising the size of the font. So it's very clear. So when you're driving by, you know, I had no problem getting 1,200 people to a gym at Windsor um, when we were, you know, working on, on Cova Mountain Forest because my signs were next to bus stops where people could pull in. They were in areas where you could easily read them and the information was very clear. Um, and yet our application signs have been challenged for so long. I hope this does it. Um, but um, I'm just, I just, I'm worried that, um, you know, we're, we're not, um, you know, understanding the clarity of replicating the signs and the sighting of them. Um, the signs that were placed for the Anthem public hearing, they were in the wrong spot. Um, you get a response. Mr. Harper, do you have, you have images poses. you're going to show us? Samples? I do, and I can show those now if you like. Okay, thank you. So, this image is the current public hearing sign as attached to the procedures bylaw. This format is the proposed new template for a public hearing sign to be attached to the procedures bylaw. This is a real world example of a public hearing sign that was installed with the signage oriented toward the roadway. This is an example of a bi-directional sign that was recently installed for the project on West 16th Street. This is not a public hearing sign. Um, these signs were installed for virtual public meetings. Sorry, that's the last image that I have. So I'll stop sharing unless a council member would like to be able to refer to the images. 
So I would just say that this sign right here, you know, this, um, you know, this information is very important. Um, the size of this, you know, is not as important. All of this information down here. Sorry, um, we can't see your cursor, Councillor. Oh, sorry. All of the information at the bottom, it, it just, that's the, 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 the last part of the sign that you need. You know, learn more, I guess, is very important how we can, um, how people can connect to the website. Um, but the development proposal, you know, what kind of meeting is this? It doesn't even, I don't even yeah, actually don't know what kind of meeting it is. This not for a specific meeting. This is just, uh, this, is, this would stay on site for a long period of time and would be replaced with one that had a meeting date. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Hartford? It, it has been replaced now with a sign that looks like the image that's currently on display, which right. says public hearing. So yeah, like early time, input, there's... public input and public hearing. I don't know why we need that. It says public hearing. I just, um, we've been around this mulberry bush so many times and it's not getting better. And, um, you know, I've, I've moved the motion, but those are my concerns. And again, um, I don't know how additional signs are triggered. Who gets to decide that? Does council have to say something? Um, how, how does that work? Thank you. We're, we're way over time. Uh, so I'm going to go to Councillor Forbes. Can I have that ans question answered? I asked it three times. Uh, Mr. Hartford, did you hear the question? I did, Your Worship, uh, Councillor Murray. The procedures bylaw requires a minimum of one bi-directional sign on the site. Um, staff review each property in particular uh, to the specifics of that property and a determination is made at a staff level, often in consultation with the communications department. Um, there, there is nothing stipulated in statute to indicate um, a particular number of signs on the property beyond the one bi-directional sign. So it's at the discretion of the manager uh, or is it at, it's not automatically prescribed in the current regulation, is that correct? Um, your Worship, it's there, Staff are asked to consult with senior management, either the assistant general manager or the general manager of the division to determine uh, location of signage and number of signs. That's the person that's getting the phone call. Okay, uh, thank you. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a lot of the similar concerns about uh, that Councillor uh, Murray has mentioned. Uh, in particular, um, for instance, just as an example, if, if there is a development that's going to happen in a cul-de-sac and you have to go in quite a ways in the cul-de-sac to the very end of the cul-de-sac where the development's happening, one bi-directional sign on that wouldn't help um, direct anybody on the nearest crossroads or the nearest arterial route uh, to get that information. As an example, I can go back to Emory and um, information was originally posted in the cul-de-sac. Then it was posted behind a tree in, in the roundabout. Then there was a sign posted rather than be posted on the intersection of Kirkstone and Mountain Highway, which are both heavily traveled areas. It was posted on Mountain Highway where the cul-de-sac entered. And so it made it very difficult. And the other thing is I'm pleased about the bi-directional because signs used to get placed facing the road. And so you couldn't actually read it until you were right up, up on top of the sign. So I'm pleased with the bi-directional part of this. Um, I have uh, some concerns about relying on the web and our web page and the paper uh, for details, just simply because the paper doesn't get delivered to everybody and not everybody gets on the computer or can find their, find their way around websites easily. So I have a little bit of concern about that. Um, but the most important thing that I think this does address, although I have some of Councillor Mary's concerns, 
is that whatever we're doing, it's going to be consistent and it's going to be, the signage will be consistent and the locations will be consistent. So I'm pleased about that in this report because uh, we need to make clear communication and it needs to be meaningful to the community around. Um, also, I, the most, uh, the other thing I would just like to mention as well is that I'm kind of a visual person as well. And I think it would have been nice if we could have had an example sign that we could see. I'm not opposed to uh, recommending this report, but I think it would be good before we really go down the road a long ways that an example sign maybe could be presented to council at a workshop or at a council meeting so that we can actually see that um, it's readable, it's informed and not too much space is left blank and not too much space is given to the unimportant parts of it. So um, I'm glad to see the district is taking a hold of this so that there's one owner of how this is gonna happen. But I would also have liked to have seen an example. Thank you. Just, just to be clear, Mr. Hartford, we have an example in situ at the West 16th proposal, is that correct? Um, your Worship and Councillor Forbes, the sign that I showed for West 16th was a uh, consultation sign drawing attention to a number of public meetings. Um, the clerk's department through Cheryl Archer has advised that she has an image of the public hearing sign that has now been installed at that property. So I might ask if Cheryl Archer could share that uh, for council's information. I, ha I had seen the first sign down there when I drove by, but I haven't seen the second sign that's gone up. Uh, Ms. Archer, are you able to share that or Mr. Milburn? Uh, thanks, Your Worship. I just wanted to mention that really the um, the proposal you see before you tonight is the culmination of, of staff trying to listen very closely to the concerns that we've heard uh, from council members, members of the, of the community, and working closely with our communications department to present uh, this type of sign, uh, which has um, uh, more clarity and focus on the key information that we think the public will need to get. Again, this is just one method of public notice. There's also a notice to distributed to neighbors, as well as a, a notice in the newspaper and our website. Uh, but this is still an, an important notice for the community. Thank you, Richard. That's, can I just say that that's another part that we need to deal with. I've always wanted the notification area to be expanded more than the, I think it's a hundred meters out. Um, but anyway, that's something else for another another meeting. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. I have Councillors Bond and Curran and uh, Councillor Bond. Thanks, Mayor Little. I uh, agree with this approach. I think that the district taking uh, ownership of the process makes a lot of sense. Uh, I agree with staff that that will provide a uh, sense of consistency and staff oversight on all of the signs. So I think that's a, a good step forward. Uh, I would agree that the new sign layout is more readable and does um, provide the uh, the type of information that's that's needed. And uh, you know, I, I think as a person that primarily uh, walks or or um, cycles around this community. Um, it's uh, it provides a level of detail for those people that are walking by the site or are uh, using a you know more traditional form of transportation that does allow them a little bit more understanding of the site. Uh, you know there are there are sign uh, standards uh, used for um, uh, people in vehicles when they're driving by to be able to read, and I think you know it's unrealistic to think that uh, someone driving by a site is going to get more than two or three words off of. A sign this size so um it's um like uh, like staff and uh, mr hartford you've mentioned it uh, for people driving by a, a particular site it's basically something is happening here and i think that you know the the bold uh type at the top of the uh page or the top of the sign uh, that says development proposal that's basically anyone's gonna gonna get from a sign uh, uh that's driving by I don't think we can do any better than that. Uh, it's just technically not 
possible with how uh, people are driving 50 or 60 kilometers an hour and how they're uh, how much time they have to read uh, at this size of sign you know unless you unless you want a very large sign uh, you're not going to get people are not going to get any more information so i think this does call attention to the site uh, people will then have to use the alternative forms if they are driving if you're walking or if you're um, you know closer to the site then you will be able to get some more information about the project so I think this, these are definitely uh, an improvement over the signs, and um, I, I think it would be a challenge for staff to do much better in order to um, you know get the attention of the driving public who might be going by these signs. So uh, I support this this work that you've done, and uh, look forward to seeing these new signs out there. I appreciate the Buffalo Springfield reference. There's something happening here, and what it is ain't exactly clear, but hopefully the sign will help fix it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Kern. Thanks. Um, just first, a point of clarification. Um, it sounds like the the signs used to be created um, for non statutory uh, reasons by the applicant. Now the district is taking it, but also there's a fee now charged. So there's no the district is not incurring any fees. We're just taking on that responsibility and billing that back to the applicant. Is that correct? Uh, your worship, Councillor Curran, that is correct. Um, there, essentially, it's cost recovery for the district. Okay, um, and then our, I just wondered about these signs. I know Mayor Little, we have we have a sign. <laughs> you like signs? I don't like signs. I like public. I like these signs, but just election signs. But um, do they get reused? Because we make quite a few of these signs. Like, so are they made in house? And are what? do we reuse the plastics? Like what actually happens to the signs? Mr. Harper? Uh, your Worship, Councillor Curran, the signs are made by a local sign company. And my understanding is that they are typically plywood and they are reused. The, the base materials are reused. Okay. Um, I would just advocate for that as we try to move towards circularity in our systems that we're reusing all the materials as many times as we can. Um, I think it is a, a challenge. Um, I like the idea that they'll be consistent. I think that's important that they'll they'll look they'll always look one way. Um, and I would say, yeah, as the the best the big big type, um, as big as you can make it in those parameters to indicate that there's something that you need to know is is really um, important. And I, I do agree that people driving by versus walking and cycling are going to have a different experience with the sign. But um, I. Yeah, I think those were my questions. Thank you, Councillor Kern. Uh, just my own comments on the matter. I mean, I heard Mr. Milburn say this is the culmination of listening to people. And I, I got to tell you, uh, we're, we're passionate about signage in this community. And so uh, that's probably going to be an ongoing process to some degree. Uh, I think what Councillor Murray was also speaking to was that um, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a human scale aspect to it. And so when you're uh, when you're parked across the street and you're 80 feet away in your car, um, you know, uh, I, I need to see, I want to see date, time, and what kind of a meeting it is. When I'm walking up to the sign, that's when you can get the further details and further information. And so uh, the site map is probably not relevant to the car or to the person at a great distance, but the site map is relevant to somebody who's walking past the site and taking their time. And, and so it can be on a more human scale. It doesn't have to be a significant portion of the sign. It can be shrunk down. And other elements of the sign, again, they're more uh, appropriate to the person who's walking up to the site. And so therefore they can be at that kind of a scale uh, so that we can free up as much space as we possibly can to uh, extend the viewable distance uh, for the critically important information. Uh, but I still think this is a dramatic improvement over what we have had. I think we've already seen that uh, even just the feedback that we've given to the contractor, uh, because it, it was a contractor that was placing the signs on some of the locations, but the feedback that we've given have already uh, caused improvements in the visibility of the signs. Uh, and uh, uh, so that kind of direction to the contractor, I think has been very helpful, but uh, I'm supportive of this. I think it's heading in the right direction. Uh, I do think that there's some things you can do with the font and making sure that it's high contrast. The one that was on the parkway was uh, three different blues were being used and things were sort of blending in together. And so making sure we're using 
high contrast materials. I know we had that discussion about uh, Lynn Valley, uh, about uh, making sure that uh, we were considering accessibility. Could someone who is low sighted be able to see this as well? And so making sure that it's high contrast fonts and high contrast colors, wherever reasonably practical. But I think you've achieved that in, in the layout uh, that, I, that I saw. It looks like something you can see from a great distance. So I'm supportive. Uh, and uh, I don't see any other speakers at this time. So I'm gonna call a question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much staff for your presentation. Get a little warmed up about sign discussions. I'm so glad we have so many of them. <laughs> uh, next up we have item 8.6, which is the Lynn Canyon pay parking pilot uh, pilot and uh, bylaw amendments. I believe we have Mr. Carney joining us for this discussion. Welcome, Mr. Carney. Thank you, Your Honor. Honor. Uh, go ahead. Uh, do you have uh, oh, um, a presentation or comments? Uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship, uh, um, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this really is a first, second, and third reading uh, to enable bylaw changes um, needed to collect the annual $10 uh, district resident exempt parking pass for the Lynn Canyon pay parking pilot, not to be confused with um, the residential parking permit uh, uh, fees that are already in place in the, uh, in the district's bylaw. So just wanted to make that distinction uh, because I know there has been a little bit of confusion in the community around that. So again, this is really just limited uh, this first, second and third re reading to the, uh, uh, the uh, district resident exempt uh, pay parking permit for Lynn Canyon Park. And so just to add to that, we, we in order to um, make these passes available to residents, uh, we need to make this um, adoption to actually three bylaws. And so uh, there is the street and traffic bylaw, uh, the fees and charges bylaw, and the bylaw notice enforcement bylaw. And so really it's a, um, uh, it's sort of a, um, uh, uh, just, you know, tidying up the, uh, the bylaws to enable um, this, uh, this uh, DNB park permit uh, to be available to residents. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Carney. And I will be moving the recommendation uh, Councillor Hansen, will you be seconding the recommendation? Yes, Your Worship, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, no, I think that this was a, a good way to accommodate uh, the concerns of residents that they might be limited in access to, to the park. We obviously wanna encourage everybody to leave their car at home uh, wherever reasonably practicable, but we also recognize that uh, uh, people should be visiting uh, their neighborhood parks as, uh, as, as part of their, um, uh, their uh, daily routines or weekly routines, wherever reasonably practicable. And, uh, uh, you know, I know we're specifically talking about the pilot project in, uh, in Lynn Canyon, but uh, always have in my mind, you know, what this effect would be on, uh, on other areas within our park system. And so I'm glad to see this piece going forward and these enabling pieces of legislation being uh, put forward. Councillor Hanson. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I don't have too much to add, um, except that I hope that the process by which uh, residents are able to acquire these passes is very simple, and that the uh, website is um, uh, modified in such a way or that the, 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 the website is made very usable for this purpose. And I, I also wondered about uh, could, could, for simplicity's sake, could uh, this $10 simply be added to the tax roll <clears throat> so that you enter your website, a very simple process by which you say, send me the uh, pass, and then the $10 just shows up in your tax bill, because it seems a shame to involve third-party um, payment agencies for the purposes of uh, a $10 payment. Uh, so those are, those are my thoughts, and uh, I, I hope that the uh, process by which uh, residents of the district interface with our website and actually acquire this uh, $10 pass is extremely simple and uh, user friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. I don't think we have a representative from finance still on the call. Mr. Carney, can you address the issue of uh, uh, options for payment? 
Uh, yes, uh, Your Worship. Um, uh, uh, th and thank you, Councillor Hansen, for the uh, the question. Um, the process is is uh, fairly straightforward um, uh, and is is explained both on our website and in the letter that was uh, distributed. And so, residents that are interested in participating in the uh, the, the resident parking only permit system. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's the same process really for the the RPO, the resident parking only system, as it is for the DNV park permit. And so, essentially, um, uh, residents just need to show um, that they are you know proof of address, and then they are eligible to to purchase that. Um, it's a completely a touchless system in the sense that. Uh, they can pay on um, uh, online with a, a credit card, and then the decals are mailed out. And so there's no need to uh, uh, interface or interact with uh, district staff. Um, I'm unsure about whether or not we can add that to property tax uh, notices. I don't think so at this time. Um, and so it's you know we've tried to keep it as straightforward as possible, and it really does mirror the um, the RPO system that's been in place for years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Curran. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was uh, one of the people who took an unpopular position, I think, on this one, um, because I feel like it is um, a transportation demand man management strategy, and so it should apply to everyone. So I'll be uh, not supporting this um, uh, at first, second, and third. Thank you. Councillor Bond. I'm of the same opinion as uh, as Council Curran on this. Uh, as a transportation demand management strategy, we are trying to um, reduce the number of cars that are going into Lynn Canyon and parking in Lynn Canyon, and therefore the fee uh, to encourage uh, alternate trips and for people to use more traditional forms of transportation, such as walking or biking or transit to get to Lynn Canyon, should apply to everyone that is. Uh, intending to park their car at Lynn Canyon. And so I think that's a matter of principle for myself. Uh, when someone that lives a five minute walk away uh, pays a $10 pass to park at Lynn Canyon all the time, and someone that lives an hour uh, away has to pay $3 an hour, I don't think that's an effective way to manage demand. I think we should be encouraging uh, those who live closer, such as district residents, to be um, taking the lead on this, uh, especially uh, since it's for demand management. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Forbes. Um, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I think I actually took the unpopular position on this that I don't think the district uh, residents should be paying anything to park in their own backyard. Um, we, and the other thing I'd like to uh, ask or ask for clarification about is uh, I asked this before, but I've never gotten an answer. Does this $10 fee cover all of our recreational areas, all of our parks, or are we going to start nickel and diming the taxpayer $10 for every uh, site that they want to go to, whether it be Deep Cove, Gross Mountain, the, wherever? Um, and I've never gotten an answer for that. So does this $10 only apply to this, to Lynn Canyon Park and that's it? Mr. Carney? Uh, through your worship, uh, and thank you, uh, Councillor Forbes. Um, well, at this point, um, uh, it, ultimately it's, it's really council's direction. So staff will uh, implement uh, the, the uh, a direction based on, on uh, uh, council. Um, and, but, you know, the, my, my thinking is that it would be applicable to all parks if we were to expand pay parking, uh, as we had previously discussed, to potentially other areas such as Deep Cove or Frome Mountain. Um, but at this stage, um, it's, it would be limited to, to Lynn Canyon. Well, then but, I would... Let's I, be clear, because that's the only one that's in the pilot. That is correct. There yes. is no pay parking at the other parks. It is the only one, therefore it is applicable in all places in the district that have pay parking in the parks. That is correct. We, we do have pay parking at Kate's Park for the boat launch, the boat launch. Um, but that would be the one exception. Mr. Stewart, do you have a question? Yeah, your oh. Worship, um, just maybe to answer Councillor Forbes' uh, question. Uh, of course, the extent to which we want to extend demand management into the other parks is, is subject to discussion with council. 
but I don't think staff at this point are anticipating that we would have a $10 deco that would only apply for Lynn, only apply to Cates, or only apply to something else. It would be a $10 deco, which would give you access to district parks. Okay, um, I, then I'll just go back to my first comment. Because of COVID-19, we saw the huge increase of uh, visitors to the North Shore who aren't residents of the North Shore to the point that local residences weren't even able to go to their backyard facilities because there was so much incoming traffic, especially on the weekends. So um, I think that anyone who lives in the district of North Van uh, shouldn't have to pay to go into the properties that are in the district of North Van. It's the same as kind of the idea of that Ambleside years ago, they wanted to put in all that pay parking in Ambleside and uh, the residents in West Vancouver weren't crazy about that. Um, I just think it's, we paid with taxes. Whoever lives here pays with the high cost of living that's on the North shore with the taxes. And I just think that, that we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be asking for $10 to go and visit your backyard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll speak uh, now. So the, the net effect though is um, if we don't put this exemption in place, then people will have to pay the hourly rate. So it's not that if, if we don't put this in that it would result in there being no fee. If we don't put this exemption in, then the result would be that they have to pay the normal rate. And no. so uh, that's uh, just something I would point out. I mean, uh, if we if we tie on this matter or uh, or it's defeated, the net effect will be that the um, uh, that the district residents will now have to pay more. Uh, and so that's that's the challenge with uh, unfortunately with the the order of, of business. Um, and so uh, I, I urge all members of council to to consider that in their decision making. Um, we're only talking about the pilot project at this point, and um, and the net effect of voting against it, it would be to have local residents pay the full regional rate. Um, so, uh, on that, uh, those are my comments. I think I have Councillor Bond a second time, followed by Council Councillor. Councillor, uh, sorry, Your Worship, I haven't spoken yet. Sorry, sorry, Councillor Beck, go ahead. That's okay. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I just want to acknowledge that I've actually. Um, given this a lot more thought uh, over the last little while, and I've actually changed my position on it. Um, initially, I, I did vote for the resident exemption. Um, however, upon further thought and the way, you know, when we talk about equity, um, it, it doesn't make sense in my mind to offer an exemption to our residents, um, those who potentially live closer to the park uh, than others. Um, I, I think about you know, if a neighboring municipality like the city of North Vancouver was to offer such an exemption, I think it would feel a bit off-putting, at least in my mind. Um, so I think, you know, by offering an exemption like this, we're kind of going against what, what we're trying to do, which is to get people to think about not using their car to get there. Um, and I think it needs to be fair for everyone. And I think by offering this upon further reflection and, and, uh, and thought, um, I don't think makes sense. So I, I will be um, voting against it. Thank you, Councillor Back. Councillor Mary, a first time? Is this the first time? Councillor Mary? Uh, yeah, I'll um, be supporting uh, the exemption for district residents. Um, I believe that the $10 is a nominal fee. And um, if we are going to embark on further um, pilots in other areas that see a tremendous amount of visitors in the area to deal with uh, demand management, I do believe it is appropriate to um, to exempt our district residents, and I think they're supportive of the uh, the ten dollar amount. I think we started at thirty, um, and I think we've got it down to ten in order to deal with the administration of um, the decal. Um, but um, this obviously is going to be a split vote. And um, it would be unfortunate if um, after all this work and all this discussion um, that the uh, residents, as Mayor Little has put out or um, stated, um, they would ultimately be paying the hourly rate. And that's not what I think um, a majority of us at one time 
um, we're considering. I agree that, um, you know, certainly through this pandemic, um, there's a lot of situations where people are, um, you know, financially challenged. Um, this whole discussion of paying um, for RPO when we're trying to deal with, um, you know, the the impact of local neighborhoods in um, regards to these uh, destinations that the region um, is coming to, um, you know, we're going to help you. We're going to try to manage the livability and the sustainability of your neighborhood, but you got to pay thirty bucks per car. Um, you know, I think that's something that we need to to look at. Um, I think probably the cost of administering it um, outweighs the amount of money that we actually bring into the municipality. And uh, I think the parking um, fees should cover um, resident parking only. That's for another discussion. But um, I hope that this is not going to fail. Um, I hope, Councillor Forbes, that you um, will support this $10 permit um, pass. For people like um, me, I, I don't generally go to Lynn Canyon in the summer because it's just too crazy. Um, but um, for anybody that does drive into these areas and use the park for a walk or a run um, that is a district resident, I think it's totally supportable, um, $10. And I think the, the majority of the community supports it. Thank you, Councillor. I believe I have Councillor Forbes next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, without being able to do an amendment, because my intent is is certainly, if I don't think we should pay $10, I certainly don't think we should be paying the hourly rate. So if I can't make it, I don't see the point after hearing the comments around the table of making an amendment uh, to this motion. So I will vote in favor of the $10 fee reluctantly, because I certainly don't want district taxpayers to be paying an hourly rate. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Beck. Apologies, Your Worship. My hand was still up from before. That's okay. Thank you. Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I, I just wanted to say that in the original workshop discussion, I also would have preferred it free for residents. Uh, but at this stage, uh, the $30 has been reduced to $10, and I'm happy to re uh, support this staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, I see no further speakers on the matter, so I'm going to call the question. So all those in favor, say aye. And all those opposed, nay. And so, Mr. Clerk, just verifying, I believe the mo motion passes with Councillors Curran, Back, and Bond opposed. Is that your record? Uh, correct, Your Worship. That's what I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Moving on to item 8.7. Uh, this is bylaws 8472 and 8476 standards and regulations in uh, single family zones. And this is a matter is returning from uh, a public hearing uh, on the matter back on January 26th. And so this is council's opportunity to respond to the uh, uh, comments and concerns expressed by the public during the public hearing and to share their initial views on the matter. I have Councillor Murray uh, as a first speaker on the list. Will you be making a motion? I'll move it. And I have Councillor Hansen as a seconder. Will you be seconding the motion? I'll second it. Thank you. Councillor Murray, go ahead, your comments. Um, thank you, Mayor Little. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a small step towards um, uh, lessening the impact of um, uh, applicants that come in and um, the, the inability for staff to have flexibility in regards to, um, you know, the siting of um, garages and, and uh, the size of retaining walls. I think we have way more work to do though. And I was pleased that Mr. Stewart brought up the, um, the revision um, of the zoning bylaw. Our challenging, um, very complex, large, um, complicated zoning bylaw. Um, I spoke to Jennifer Patton um, last week and she's been at the district for decades. 
and um, she started very, very young. And uh, she, uh, you know, has commented over the years on the need to review the zoning bylaw. And, and I also spoke to Miss Atva, um, and uh, Miss Atva was responsible for um, rewriting a zoning bylaw for the city of Abbotsford, and I think took it from a document like this and took it down to a document like this that was easily um, read, easily managed, and flexible in its interpretation. Um, you know, examples like um, the ones that we are all familiar with, and I, I personally don't care if it's one example or a hundred examples. I don't want, I personally didn't get into this job to, um, you know, have a negative impact on the residents in the district. If there's a way around a negative impact, why wouldn't we go around? Um, instead of just allowing it to happen. I think the Wedge House was one of the most, um, uh, you know, extreme examples of what didn't need to happen. If we had had flexibility, if we had had something written in the zoning bylaw, um, it would have been very easy for the plan checker to say to the applicant, no, sorry, you don't make, make that that, um, that crawl space um, height, uh, there's a limit there. You're gonna have to move it over to the other side of um, your driveway. And that would have um, removed the extreme impact that the homeowners of the Wedge House are now living with because we allowed a full height um, uh, area below the garage. Um, the skyline is another one. And I've, real, I've thought about this a lot and um, I've realized what's happened is that because we don't count the basement in square footage for houses, um, whole basements, whole, like the, the ground is being completely um, excavated. Massive basements are going into these houses and on a slope, they're taking up the entire area of the level piece of the property. And in order to be able to um, uh, uh, address their need for yard space, which is the, in the case of the wedge or uh, the skyline house, they are cantilevering out on their property. And that is why we are, are seeing these massive um, retaining walls um, because they have to lift their pools or their patios up above uh, the slope of their um, frontage. And, um, you know, I, I just think that we really need a lot of work um, going forward in regards to um, the impact to the environment, the water table, flora and fauna. I mean, we've seen Upper Capilano, um, you know, in many areas clear cut because of the large basements and uh, the large size of homes that are going in. And once we're, what once were neighborhoods that were filled with trees and gardens are now filled with, um, in many cases, hardscape. And um, it's impacting our creeks, it's impacting our storms. So I think the, the zoning bylaw really does need to be reviewed. Um, and, uh, but I think this is a start. Um, are there going to be um, uh, variances coming forward? Absolutely. Um, but it gives us an ability to be able to um, take a second look and not ever again negatively impact a homeowner. It's the biggest investment people make. And why should one um, design trump uh, a, another property owner so negatively that I think in the cases of those two properties, um, their, value, their property values have been impacted and uh, their livability and the enjoyment of their homes. It's, it's, uh, it was devastating for them. So if this is going to go to um, amending that, then I'm in favor. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Seconder is Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, uh, I can start by saying that I very carefully considered uh, the input at the uh, public hearing. Uh, I am uh, pleased to support what I consider to be uh, modest and reasonable changes uh, in these two bylaws. Uh, to summarize the changes that are involved, uh, first, with respect to retaining walls, the current regulation allows the first wall to be four feet and the second wall must be uh, contain, contained within a height envelope of a 45 degree angle. 
the proposed change limits the first wall to three feet and the subsequent walls uh, to a height envelope of a 35 degree um, uh, angle. The result is a smaller, uh, less obtrusive retaining wall. Uh, in my view, the result is also construction, which is more in keeping with uh, uh, prevailing community character. Uh, the negative is that some yards with, it, with steep slopes are going to be more difficult uh, to build on and uh, they will have to seek a variance. And as Councillor Murray said, then the uh, variance can be considered on an individual basis, considering the whole community. So I believe that's a modest change and uh, easy to support and uh, it sends us in the right direction, I view, in terms of uh, built form in the district. Uh, the second change uh, concerns the height of detached accessory buildings. Uh, currently, there's no a limit on the floor height of detached accessory buildings, including garages. And this can result in high foundation walls on steep slopes and lots of visible concrete. The proposal will, would limit the floor height of accessory buildings to four feet from the natural grade. The benefit uh, is that there'll be less concrete, uh, less obtrusive walls uh, stretching from the ground to the floor on the structure. Uh, the negative again is it could be harder to build on uh, steep slopes and uh, that is a matter that can be dealt with through a variance. Uh, so I believe uh, these are reasonable bylaws. They discourage the excessive use of concrete and they encourage in my view a built form which is more in keeping with our community character. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Hansen. Next speaker is Councillor Back. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will not be supporting the recommendation tonight. Um, I did listen carefully to all of the input that we received, um, uh, both through the staff report and the, the, input, the public hearing input. Um, we have not heard uh, re really much in the way of support for these changes. Um, while I certainly recognize and, and empathize with the extreme cases in our community, uh, such as the ones mentioned, uh, the Wedge House, uh, the house on Skyline, um, who are negatively impacted um, by the way the current bylaw works. Um, we didn't hear support, uh, certainly from the building industry. There was, there was a lot of questions about why we would be doing this and some of the implications. Um, and then the, the members of the community who spoke at the public hearing also had a number of concerns. Um, this is a relatively complicated um, change that we're concept to understand. And the change that we're making is, is quite wide uh, sweeping. So I think that uh, it's something we need to continue to explore. Obviously, as I've said, there are issues in our community where, you know, where this is, these sorts of things are having negative impacts on the neighbors. Um, but I don't think we've landed on the right solution. And in my mind, I think we need to be going back and, and speaking to industry um, and trying to learn a little bit more about this issue before making a, a change like this one. So at this point, I'm, I'm not prepared to support uh, the changes as they're presented here. Thank you, Councillor Back. Councillor Bond. Thank you, Mayor Little. I will we'll be in agreement with Councillor Back on on this topic. Um, you know, as been as has been mentioned uh, both during the public hearing and uh, during Council's discussion, these bylaw changes are in response to one or two, I think, two very specific incidents on two very specific sites in which uh, the existing bylaws um, resulted in an outcome that was um, detrimental to uh, the neighbors. And, you know, I think, um, you know, this council, we've had other sweeping bylaw changes proposed based on one or two complaints. And, you know, I think, um, you know, Christmas lights and, and pigeons come to my, to my mind. And I don't think that this type of reactionary approach uh, to site specific conditions uh, on one or two sites that we that we know of uh, over a, a significant amount of time is an effective way to govern and I don't think it's an effective way to uh, address 20,000 potential properties in the district uh, that will be a, uh, impacted by uh, a bylaw change you know I, I think I, you know I agree with Councillor Murray uh, in in general terms that, our zoning bylaw does need a, a, a big look and a big overhaul, and that the uh, impacts of primarily um, 
the uh, the land value and maxing the maximum house size are having detrimental Im impacts on the environment. You know, the excavation required for um, single family teardown and, and reconstruction, um, the impacts on groundwater and, and all those things. I think those are challenges in our community right now. I, I don't think this is an effective way uh, to do that. I think we need to get back to that discussion around um, maximum home size, uh, around some other things in order to address those concerns specifically. Um, in this case, for this bylaw, uh, I think we do know that if the bylaws proposed tonight were in place, then the outcome and the impact on those two specific properties, on those two specific sites would have been, been different. But from the work that's been done and you know the questions that I asked of staff during the public hearing, I don't know if it's going to address other sites and other site specific conditions in the same way that we are intended. We're trying to write a bylaw for something that happened in the past that we can't change. And so um, I think the concept of uh, unintended consequences comes into play here. You know, if we're making these types of uh, very specific recommendations to how uh, retaining walls and uh, other structures are placed on uh, on sites, it's going to make a change on, it's gonna be different on every different site. It could mean that there is actually more excavation required and, and a different type of wall on a different side of the property that might have impact to the other neighbor instead of the, the downside neighbor. So um, you know, the analysis that has been done, uh, well, actually there hasn't been a lot of analysis done and not a lot, not a lot of concrete examples provided throughout this process, which um, you know, I had asked for uh, prior to the public hearing. But since it's so site specific, uh, I don't think that these bylaw changes are gonna have the intended effect. And I think that the risk for uh, other conse uh, unintended consequences is, is actually far greater. Uh, this will apply to thousands and thousands of properties and uh, we might actually get something worse off than we have right now. So I won't be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Uh, so my comments on that, I mean, uh, this narrative of that this is occurring because of one or two uh, complaints or because of one or two properties is ridiculous. First of all, uh, you can have generally applicable bylaws that one person may have pointed out the problem, but that doesn't mean it's a pro not a problem everywhere else. And if you listen to the public hearing, uh, our staff said, I believe it was eight of the last 10 new home uh, projects would not be conforming with this new wall. It's not one or two instances, it's people are maxing out to the current bylaw because they feel there's an entitlement to level uh, terracing in every part of the community. And so there are a tremendous number of, of, of examples of people who have maxed out and gone above what this, this recommendation is. And, and I, you only have to drive through some of the hillier neighborhood, neighborhoods uh, uh, to start to see this concrete wall effect that's taking place as you drive down a street and you can all you look up at the property and all you see is wall, 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 wall. And um, I don't think that's a desirable effect. And uh, I, I listened very closely in the, uh, in the public hearing and I, and I do hear the, the construction community's concerns. I also have to weigh that with the fact that the construction community makes a lot of money off building retaining walls in the district of North Vancouver. And it does limit their flex, this, this will limit their flexibility to, um, to level out the site. I don't have an issue with retaining walls in most applications. In fact, they perform some very important roles for um, slowly releasing water in a community where otherwise it would come down a natural slope quite quickly. And so sometimes you can have a retaining wall that actually adds, uh, adds to um, a net positive in hydrology. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just mass fortification of, of properties. And so it's not one or two, let's just put that to rest. I don't understand the, the point of that. This was eight of the last 10 new home applications would not be compliant with this, uh, this new regulation. And um, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's trending in a direction that's going to uh, fortify our community in a way that I don't think will be um, desirable. Um, and so uh, I, I do think, though, I will say, Council One, that I think it um, it leads to a longer term discussion, which I think the council needs to have about um, siting and use of sites. I, I think that in the long run, we are going to have to have discussion about exemptions for basement space, space, 
and whether we should be allowing more massing um, on above above ground to reduce the impact of, uh, of, of, of basements. I think that is a future discussion that we do need to have. I think we could do a lot more to improve hydrology by having that discussion. Um, and, uh, but it's not what's before us here today. Uh, what's before us here today is to try to find a reasonable uh, um, amount of maximum height so that games aren't being played where someone puts the retaining wall way out at the edge of the property so that they can put a 45 degree slope up and have uh, this, uh, this massive uh, unlimited height in, in, uh, uh, in retaining walls on the property, which um, is just uh, not desirable. And I, and I get it. I, I think actually Wedge House is not a good example of this particular problem because the Wedge House itself probably actually towed into the neighbor's property, which would have a limiting effect on what the neighbor could build on the property. And so you always have to be aware of that impact as well. But I think this is gonna be an improvement. I think this is going to address the trend in the direction that we, we are going. It's uh, definitely something that we're going to have to monitor, uh, but uh, I will be supportive. Uh, the next speaker I have is Councillor Curran, Miri Forbes Hansen. Councillor Curran. Thank you, um, and thanks for everyone's comments. I think everyone makes um, points that are worth pondering. Um, I think generally uh, the concrete <laughs> limitations and um, things like that we can all agree is not uh, something that we want to see. Um, I guess I would look to staff for a comment about, um, because I think generally I do really like to take a more comprehensive look and so, um, it, what would what would we look looking at our zoning bylaw because I think in that same workshop there were other the other issues that were brought up about um, from passive builders like allowing buildings to come up higher to get places out of the basement hydrology all of these other concerns that are not addressed and so um, you know I really would like to take a comprehensive look at it rather than chipping away at it um, because it's a better way to do it is that could staff speak to what that time frame would be, and rather than potentially doing bits at a time, Mr. Milburn, uh, Your Worship, given the uh, complex and interrelated issues with uh, with basements, I think it's we've heard some some of those comments tonight around uh, uh, seep implementation objectives, around um, uh, having secondary suites and, and meeting our housing objectives in the community around impervious surface area and water drainage and uh, natural space. Uh, it's it, complex issues. And um, I think a, a perfect forum for that conversation that's really up upcoming quite shortly is council's uh, action planning uh, discussions around the official community plan. And um, I think there will be more opportunities for uh, specific workshop conversations around single family renewal and the other issues that, that council had raised uh, previously. Tonight's uh, um, uh, rezoning uh, just really deals with uh, two of those issues. Uh, others were, were discussed previously by council. Um, if we look at the scale of a complete uh, zoning bylaw rewrite, uh, that would be something that would probably come out of the conversation if that was council's direction uh, on the official community plan uh, uh, targeted review. And that would be uh, uh, probably a multi-year effort uh, that uh, would potentially span, as I say, given the, the timing of, of this uh, council's term um, into the next council mandate. We probably wouldn't want to be introducing bylaws around a significant change to the zoning bylaw um, just before uh, the next election. So um, uh, these conversations are likely to span uh, over into the, the next council term, uh, but they certainly could start. Um, and, and of course, all of this is subject to council's direction. That's just my high level assessment at this point. And thank you. And then the, um, because the subject of um, single family zoning has been brought up by the Rental and Affordable um, Housing Task Force, as well as um, feedback for the OCP white paper, um, I'm just wondering how that would potentially connect to this um, in the shorter term. Um, it, could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Because there's, yes, and, there's a lot happening in this space is what I'm getting at, I guess. That's right. There's a lot of potential amendments to the zoning that are being discussed right now and, and at the table with the housing task force. And I think the important thing um, in the conversations that we will be having with the official community plan target review is are, are there specific key items that council would like to advance on, on a quicker basis than possibly a full review of the zoning bylaw to try to achieve some of the council's goals around housing or the environment or other issues. And, and so we do definitely look forward to having that conversation uh, with council about the, the trade-offs of those two approaches. 
And I guess my last question, would you see anything that um, by approving these, would that limit the approach that um, when, as we go into the OCP white paper review, would you approach that differently with this or not? Or do you see these as relatively minor in the big scheme of things? I'm just trying to kind of put them in perspective because some of the things that I, um, you know, brought forward, I would, I think are, are more uh, significant in the, in the big picture. And um, I just wondered if you could speak to that. Yeah, so these, um, I would probably put these in the, the category of um, uh, not as significant as the, the broader discussion that I think I've heard tonight uh, around secondary suites and uh, uh, massing of buildings and um, uh, exemption of a floor space. Those are bigger, more technically complex and uh, having significant uh, impacts to many areas of the community. Uh, the issues at, at, at conversation tonight are, are much more specific. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kern. Councillor Mary. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, a lot of these issues um, in regards to uh, accessory buildings and retaining walls can simply, and I think the mayor eloquently pointed this out, um, it can all be done by design. It's all simple design. Um, architects design um, around the bylaw. It is not um, required, it is just allowed. It is, um, it is what an applicant can achieve um, by maxing out under the current bylaw. And, you know, Councillor Bond um, believes that this is just a couple of examples, but um, all of those examples exist, existed on a hill and uh, that's how we're built in the district. Um, it's not one size fits all. Um, we are built on the side of a mountain. Um, and so the impact and the um, outcome of um, property situated on slopes um, certainly have a very detrimental effect um, uh, under the current bylaw um, to the downhill property uh, owners. And uh, last time I checked, uh, the vast majority of um, single family neighborhoods are built on hills, on slopes in the district of North Vancouver. So I um, completely concur with Mayor Little's comments. Um, we will trend the designers and, and you know, let's, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Most of these are not the uh, renovation single family property owner. These are spec uh, contractors and developers that are buying lots and ripping the existing house down and maxing out on the square footage um, for a significant return of investment. Um, you know, most of you have not been around um, as long, well, none of you have been around as long as I've been around, um, but we used to do variances every Monday night. That was just a, a typical um, a role as, a, as our council. That's what we, we did every Monday night. We approved variances and nine out of 10 variances were approved. Um, developers and, and architects will just get around this um, by designing differently. They won't need a variance. They'll just look at the, the property and they'll do it differently and they won't even come forward with one. Um, so I, I don't know what the, down, the downside to this is, um, just protecting um, existing homeowners, um, protecting their properties and making sure that impacts are minimal. And, uh, and then we can move forward with a very lengthy, re, re, you know, looking at our zoning bylaw and revamping it is a very long process. Nothing is gonna happen overnight. Um, but meanwhile, there will be properties that will be impacted by this, and it will be many, many more than um, the two examples that Councillor Bond believes that this is about. It's about all of the people that live in the district. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillor Hanson. Uh, th thank you very much. I, I just wanted to push back a little bit on the uh, suggestion that these particular bylaws are complicated or that they're gonna have uh, particularly extreme consequences. I, I, I think they're actually, and I articulated them, I took the time to actually articulate the change. I, I think the changes in fact are not complicated. They're relatively simple. I also think that the changes are relatively modest. 
the broad outcome I believe to be widely supported by our community. I mean, we heard from some people in the construction industry who had very specific uh, mandates to want to pour a lot of concrete. Uh, but if you remove them from the picture, in my respectful view, uh, this would be a widely supported change in our community. The overall effect, less excavation, less concrete, and that's something that our community stand behind. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Beck. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I appreciate that it it maybe is not that complicated, but I think it for the average person is a little bit complicated uh, to your point, Councillor Hanson, but I appreciate that you've taken the time, uh, probably more than the average person to try and understand it. Uh, I guess I just go back to my previous point, and that is that this is not something that we've heard from the community in any great number as being an issue. Um, to Councillor Bond's point, um, it really has come as a result of a, a handful of complaints. Um, and I certainly again, empathize with those people. Um, but I just don't think that, um, you know, creating this kind of change now is going to solve um, the problem. Uh, and in fact, might create some other other issues. And um, as far as having a comprehensive look at the zoning bylaw, I, I would certainly support that and, uh, and would, you know, look forward to doing that if we can uh, before the end of this term. But again, I, I can't support this, this uh, recommendation as it is now. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bond. Just a few additional comments. Um, you know, I think this is a complex change. If you ask, uh, if you need an architect and uh, uh, a construction um, company and designers and engineers to figure out how to put your retaining walls on your property, then it's probably not as simple as has been made out tonight. And the impacts are going to be different on every site. Every site has a different slope. Every site has uh, different setbacks, a different width and depth of a lot. And therefore, these changes are going to impact every site differently. And when you make a sweeping change to 20,000 properties, uh, there will be a lot of unintended impacts. And we don't actually know if it's going to result in less excavation or if it's going to result in more. We don't actually know if it's going to result in less concrete or it's going to result in more concrete uh, because the impacts on every site will be different. And so that's why uh, I am opposed to this. And, you know, to the point that, you know, uh, it's two examples, you know, I'm happy to stand by that. You know, this bylaw has been in place for a long time. This existing bylaw has been in place for a long time. So hundreds of homes in the district, possibly thousands have been constructed under this bylaw. And we have had two complaints, uh, you know, uh, going back to your conversation about the, um, the attractants bylaw, I'm here, Mayor Little, you know, uh, if it's that effective and we've had hundreds or thousands of homes and only two complaints, then it's actually a pretty good bylaw as it is. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I think there will be unintended consequences and we may look back five years from now and uh, say that we haven't done enough, enough analysis on this and we haven't really uh, determined that other than the two sites that have been brought to mind, uh, whether this is going to have a positive impact on the rest of the sites in the community. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, just my last comments on this. Um, I, I'm not going to be shamed to not take action just because there may be one example, two examples, five examples, 10, and it's not enough. Uh, if we recognize that our, our bylaws are producing something that's negative for our community, then we need to be able to respond. Uh, when I hear members of council say they feel sorry for these people, but then they're not willing to do anything to change it, I sit and I question, why'd you get into the job? right? Uh, we should all be in this job to try to make things better for the people in our community. And so um, they don't want our sympathy. They want us to take action and find ways to solve the problems. And, and I can understand if you don't agree with the wording of this one, or if you think it's too complex, or if you think that the, 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 the heights and changes may not produce the results, that's totally fine. But trying to shame someone for saying that, uh, they, uh, um, that they're responding to the community concerns coming up, I don't think is going to be beneficial to anyone. Uh, those are just my comments on it. Uh, the one other comment I will make, just the last comment I'll make, is that um, 
this will have the effect of making quite a number of properties non-conforming. And I just want to be clear that people will still be able to maintain their existing retaining walls and keep them in good standing. Obviously, the community would have a vested interest in, in that aspect of it. And that was something that was restated in the public hearing. But I just want to make that absolutely clear that existing um, uh, retaining walls will be still permitted to be properly maintained, even if they're non-conforming. Uh, I think the, is it, sorry, Councillor Bond, your hand is still up, but then uh, I think it's Councillor Curran next. Um, thanks. What an interesting debate, Council. Um, could um, staff, because I really think this is hard because I, there's a lot to agree, like I agree um, that the big retaining walls and a lot of concrete, I mean, there's other things I'd like to see, carbon taxes for concrete, lots of things I think we can do. I think most people would agree that that's a negative outcome. Uh, I don't. I don't think we want to see that. Um, I think hydrology is important. Um, so as much as Councilor Hansen says it's simple, I don't find it to be as simple um, uh, because I, I do think it's a complex issue. But could staff comment specifically on the the because there's two bylaws that we're talking about. Um, one is retaining walls, and it's lowering the height, changing the angle um, is the proposal. Uh, is the most significant, um, could you speak to that be, that and concrete? Like just, just your, if you take a lot and the, the goes from three to four, um, is the overall concrete going to be the same? Um, because there's actually more, because you have to put retaining walls potentially closer. Talk about con complex. <laughs> We're going to wire out, uh. I'd like the carbon yeah. accounting, please, of the... Uh... <laughs> Your Worship, I, I just, uh, unfortunately, I just need to note that we're at a post-hearing conversation, yeah. and so I wouldn't be able to introduce new information to the conversation for Council, other than to note that, as it was noted in the staff report, uh, we're proposing a smaller wall, so less amount of volume of wall uh, is proposed in this application. Or and this, then, pardon me, in this uh, okay, concept. And I, thank, you. thank you for clarifying that. I had forgotten that. Um, I'll keep it to what I think was already discussed that could use clarification. The height, this also introduces for the first time a maximum height to retaining walls. Is that correct? Like that, because there's no limit now on certain walls and this introduced a maximum height of something. Is that accurate? Uh, Mr. Dwyer could comment the, the specifically with respect to the bylaw. There was a height limit, but if you had a lot of a certain shape and, and angle, then no, you could build fairly large. Isn't that correct, Mr. Dwyer? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So the the um, existing bylaw uh, currently has um, first retaining wall four feet, and then any subsequent retaining wall to be contained within a, a height envelope of 45 degrees with no height limit, other than to say that um, there is a maximum height limit for any structure in the zone. So for a flat roof structure, typically it's around 22 feet. So that would, you would max out at that point, but that's that's all existing information in the bylaw. Um, oh. the, okay. the, new, the new bylaw has a maximum height of any retaining wall uh, as uh, discussed at the public hearing of eight feet. Thank you. And then on the second, um, the second piece of the the maximum height of what goes underground. Could you um, explain how that how it affects hydrology? I think that that was part of the public hearing. Um, like, is there is the water uh, displaced differently if the holes? Uh, again, it would be uh, unique to probably every site. So um, we've got areas in the municipality that have a high water table we have, and there's there's challenges with even the simplest of, of excavations. And we've got areas in the municipality that are, you know, quite permeable and, and uh, digging a deeper foundation for to set it, to set an accessory building lower in the ground would not cause a problem. So um, it, it, you know, as we discussed, it would, it's different implications for different sites and there's no one size fits all. I see no further speakers from council. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor and opposed. 
Okay, so the motion passes with Councillors Curran, Back, and Bond opposed. Is that your uh, your record, Clerk? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Council, moving along onto item 8.8. Uh, this is Councillor Hansen's report on Indigenous land acknowledgements. Uh, Councillor Hansen, uh, I'll give the floor over to you and uh, feel free to make a recommendation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this motion arises out of uh, my service uh, since 2015 on Metro Vancouver's Indigenous uh, Relations Committee uh, as a representative of the district. On the February 4th meeting, uh, the issue of land acknowledgements, uh, was th this is a, the February 4th meeting of Metro Vancouver's Indigenous Relations Committee. Uh, the issue of land acknowledgements uh, was discussed and debated amongst the uh, members of that committee. Uh, in my verbal report on that meeting, which took place on the uh, February 8th regular council meeting, I said I would be raising the issue of uh, Indigenous land acknowledgements before uh, Council. Reconciliation, of course, is a broad and important goal. As a community and indeed as a culture, we seek to better understand and resolve the wrongs of the past and to place our relationship, all of our relationships, uh, on a better footing with the founding peoples of our country. Senator Murray Sinclair, who was the chairman of the Indian Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation Commission, said the following about reconciliation. And I'm gonna quote from him. Reconciliation is about atonement. It's about making amends. It's about apology. It's about recognizing responsibility. It's about accounting for what has gone on. But ultimately, it's about a commitment to maintaining that mutually respectful relationship throughout, recognizing that even when you establish it, there will be challenges to it. Respect. That is a word that Murray Sinclair says lies at the very heart of reconciliation. And I, I believe that is the word that we must consider when we think of a path forward towards reconciliation. And I believe that land acknowledgements by local government are a way of simply showing that respect. I have drafted this motion so as to ensure that the involved First Nations, our friends and our neighbors of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations will be consulted in the process. If our goal is to show respect, we must ensure that whatever land acknowledgements we adopt are perceived to be respectful by them. I note that both the City of North Vancouver and uh, the District of West Vancouver have already initiated land acknowledgements uh, as indeed have many, although not all, of the uh, local governments uh, representing uh, Metro Vancouver. So I'm very pleased to be bringing uh, this matter forward. I look forward to a discussion and uh, I look forward to council support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Is there a seconder for the motion? I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Murray. Any comments, Councillor Murray? No, I um, absolutely concur with um, Councillor Hattinson's um, uh, report and I thank him for bringing this forward. I think it's entirely appropriate to uh, begin our meetings in this way and, um, and uh, absolutely a um, respectful way to acknowledge um, uh, the original owners and settlers of this land. You know, uh, Councillor Muri, I will just mention that your your um, audio is getting very soft and a little bit oh, hard. Oh, sorry. To hear okay, I'll, sorry, I'll turn it up. Sorry, I'm supportive of the motion. Hear that? Is that better? Okay. Thank you. I've got Councillor Back followed by Councillor Curran. Councillor Back. Thank you. Yeah, excuse me. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Councillor Hansen, for bringing this forward. 
Um, I, I guess I want to recognize that there's a whole number of steps involved in reconciliation. Um, and so far as a municipality, I think very few have actually been taken. Um, so I think this, this is an important step. Um, I just, I question whether it's the first step that we should be taking. Um, I certainly believe indigenous land acknowledgements are an important gesture as they do um, only represent, but they do only represent a small part of the, the broader reconciliation effort. So um, my hope is that in crafting these statements, we would be working hand in hand with the tsleil Nation and the Squamish Nation um, to really make this all about them because um, it needs to obviously be something that they are very, very much a part of and ensure that the language is as meaningful and relevant uh, to them as it can possibly be. Um, but I also think that this really is an ideal opportunity and perhaps the opportunity to start those broader discussions around what reconciliation really means in our community and, and what other specific actions we can be taken. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a good step, um, but I just want to acknowledge that it's, it is just a small part. And um, I think there's, there's much bigger conversations that we need to be having about what other actions that we can be taking uh, within the district. Thank you, Councillor Back. Councillors Curran and Bond. Councillor Curran. Thank you. Um, yeah, I also um, am still in the process of doing a lot of learning myself, um, but uh, I am actually taking a course tomorrow, timely, um, about uh, land acknowledgements that's led by um, uh, one person who's Indigenous. It doesn't, they, of course, no Indigenous person speaks for all Indigenous people, but um, I think uh, what I've learned so far is that it's really um, about reconnecting to the land um, and really acknowledging um, the land and um, the, the caretakers and the, the stewards of that land for thousands of years before colonization. Um, so I think it is um, an, a, an opportunity um, for us to learn. And um, I appreciate that it is uh, that the motion is to actually just begin the process. Um, this is one piece of, I think, um, lifelong work. Um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that we haven't taken action since the Truth and, uh, these are separate issues, but related um, that the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission of Canada calls to action came out in 2015. Um, and we haven't taken um, substantive action yet. So I'm, I'm but I, I feel like we have on December 8th when council approved um, implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission calls to action, that's a significant step. Um, one of those steps is to use the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People as a framework for reconciliation. Um, and uh, so I think that this is part of a, a lifelong process. Um, I'll be really interested to hear what Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish Nation, um, what their uh, how, it, how it's received and how we can um, move forward together in a good way. Um, and so I think that that's a, a reasonable step to do. And it is um, important, um, I've learned to ensure that there's compensation honorariums for um, anyone who's working um, on uh, this on behalf of the nation. Oftentimes they'll have elders involved. And so um, that that's an important um, piece of this as well. So I, I see this as a part of a, of a lifelong um, commitment and um, to really, uh, and I look forward to the opportunity to work more closely with um, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish Nation on this and other things. So those are my you, comments. Councillor Curran, Councillor Bond. Yeah, I think similar to Councillor Curran, um, I hope this is a start in the process. And, and like Councillor Back, I, I don't know if it's, um, the most uh, important part of the process right now or the most important action that we can take before, uh, to reconciliation. But I think um, starting with this motion and, and starting this and leaving the conversation open-ended. Uh, you know, I know at least in the learning that I've done, um, uh, there are differing views uh, on land acknowledgements, uh, both uh, how the land acknowledgement is made and when an appropriate time for a land acknowledgement might be and it may not uh you know may not be an appropriate time at the beginning of our um you know colonial government meeting uh on uh on unceded territory where we're about to make decisions and land use decisions on, on those unceded lands that might not be the appropriate time for uh a land acknowledgement until a lot 
more work towards reconciliation has been done. But I think it having the conversation and leaving it open ended and uh, certainly uh, making sure that um, members of the nation are provided with compensation uh, for the work that they're going to do uh, that we're requesting them to do. I think, uh, you know, if we uh, as a local government, um, people come to us and ask for our services, uh, we have <laughs> fees and charges for those types of things. So uh, going and asking for uh, the nation's time and their effort to help us with this process should be um, should be provided with uh, compensation, I think. So I think uh, leaving that open is uh, is really important. And I think, yeah, uh, mostly leaving this as an open ended conversation and uh, and centering the uh, the wants and the desires of the of the nations in this in this process. Um, but I, I thank Councilor Hansen for taking this, uh, I think, important step. And hopefully it's uh, it's just one of many uh, steps that we are will be taking for a long time in this uh, journey towards reconciliation. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Um, some of my own comments on this matter, um, you know, obviously uh, a lot of discretion is given to the mayor in running meetings and what I say at the front end of the meeting and, uh, and, and how we conduct things. Some things are prescribed specifically by the provincial government uh, through our uh, charter and our local government act that governs the powers under which we operate. Um, you know, I, I think that we do need to have a land acknowledgement for the District of North Vancouver, and we need to come to it with our neighbors. I think actually Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil as a as a group of three, we typically recognize MST for, uh, for most things. I realize that uh, Squamish and, and tsleil have, have reserves on the North Shore, but it's territorial land for all three, three nations, um, and so we probably should extend it to Musqueam as well. Um, what I'd like to see come out of it is not the pat acknowledgement at the front that you throw in at the front of the meeting. What I'm feeling like is that they're not substantive. They don't have enough information in them. They don't actually tell the story of the history of the land and people's connection to the land. And so I think what we should be doing is, is preparing a longer statement and putting it on our website, putting, we can put it in the agenda package uh, we can use it at special events uh, as a recognition, but it should be more substantive than, than the short um, ones that you start seeing at organizations. The hesitation with the short ones is um, it becomes a bit like the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer and other things that were used um, at the beginning of public ceremonies for generations. Uh, they tend to... Um, they tend to become uh, less value, uh, and they don't they don't actually tell you a story, and they tend to divide people, or um, at the very least become uh, a source of, of you know they just become a pat answer or a, a response without meaning. Uh, and I don't want it to become that. I want it to be a full discussion about the history of the land, what was happening at uh, 2,700 years before present at Kate's Park and at uh, and Belcara and how that ties into Locarno Beach and uh, where people were switching between being nomadic settlers in the community and actually setting up establishments in, in the community and the history of it. I'd love to tell that story. I'd love to tell that story with, uh, um, in our community and love to, um, uh, to, to spend time sharing it. Um, we, we have with the new museum and archives, we have a section of the museum, which is not quite open yet, but uh, it will be about that relationship with the, our First Nations community and their relationship to the land. And that's the kind of thing where you actually are giving information and, and substantive details and educating people about, uh, about the connection to the land. Um, and so I, I tend to think that we should focus our energies on that. Uh, but again, uh, I'm, I'm open to going to uh, uh, MST and uh, consulting with them to get advice on, on wording and, and maybe more information. They also have, uh, I will just say that, you know, uh, I've read um, uh, one of the young students' master thesis just this last week uh, from the tsleil -Waututh Nation, and um, uh, they, they are uh, supporting young people going and learning about the history on the North Shore and, and throughout their territorial claim. And uh, we should be giving them forum. We should be creating an opportunity for these young people who are, who are um, uh, adding information to this area to make sure that the community knows what, what it is that's uh, that's coming forward. So 
so I think there's a lot of good that can come from this. Uh, I, I don't know that um, uh, having a short um, uh, comment at the beginning of our council meetings is necessarily substantive, constructive, or um, uh, you know likely to 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 be supported in, in the community in the way that some people think it will. Uh, and so I would prefer to have a broader discussion as something that we can promote in the community. Um, so. What I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do is bifurcate the motion slightly, separate the first paragraph from the second, because I think you're hearing broad support from the council for working with First Nations to create a statement. Um, but I think you're hearing a couple of, maybe three that are said that they, they're not quite ready to say that it will be at the beginning of every council meeting and would prefer to let the process play out a little bit. So I think uh, with that, I, I'm gonna propose that we bifurcate the motion between the paragraphs. But. I've got councillors back and current. Thank Councilor you, Your Worship. Um, just just to acknowledge that there's so much work happening in this area by by some of our uh, partner agencies. I know you've uh, in the report, Councillor Hansen mentioned uh, the Muse Museum and Archives, Manova, mm -hmm. and our new museum. And uh, Count and Your Worship, you mentioned the the work that they're doing as well. Um, they do something a little bit different at their meetings from what I've just experienced in only my first meeting, but they actually give each uh, member of the board a chance to give that land acknowledgement and personalize it in their own way and, and say sort of what it means to them, um, which I think is kind of an interesting way of doing it. Um, and also our district public library board has just in the late stages of, of, of finalizing their land acknowledgement. So I know staff will be looking out to, to partner organizations, but um, uh, there, there's lots of great work happening already. So um, we just wanted to highlight a couple of examples. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Beck. Councillor Kerr. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm just rereading uh, the, the motion and I do think that it's, it's open enough to have staff, um, whether, because it would really, to me, it would be important to hear if that's important. Um, for the nations for us to acknowledge at the beginning, then that's, I would say yes. If they say it's not important, then I would say, okay. So I, I think it's open enough that it says report back to options um, and that it's, it's engagement with um, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh is, is in the motion. So I, I'm comfortable um, having that come back. And um, so my recommendation would be that we vote on on is because I think it's flexible to allow for that conversation to happen because I, I I wouldn't want to say what we should or shouldn't do at this point because I'm not sure um, what the position would be of the nations that we're trying to um, honor by doing this does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah question are there any other comments from council your Worship, can you confirm then what we're, are we voting on the recommendation as it is? Well, I, uh, Councillor Curran makes a compelling argument that it just puts the options in, in staff's hands to present multiple directions that we could go. The only thing that I would express as a concern is that if we go to First Nations and we, we, we lead with that and they decide that they, they think it's uh, of value, then it you know, it, re it would really limit the district's ability to decide whether there was a more appropriate way for us just for functioning or managing the meetings. But um, I I'll accept Councillor Curran um, made an argument that this is just going, this is going to present options for us going forward uh, and not commit us to one or another at that time. Uh, Councillor Hanson. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Richard. And I'll be brief, except to say that I think Councillor uh, Curran has I captured the spirit of the motion. I mean, my goal was to ask staff uh, to, first of all, consult with the uh, relevant nations. And uh, then uh, with that uh, consultation underway to develop a protocol, if they uh, feel that it would be uh, respectful of them, uh, that shows respect to them and uh, that moves us in the direction of reconciliation. And I, I think the motion captures uh, that uh, spirit, and uh, I would I look forward to the staff report and uh, feedback from staff. Okay, I see no further speakers from council. So uh, I'm, unless I hear so otherwise, I will not bifurcate it, and I will do it as as the whole motion. I think uh, the people that had suggested they had some concerns all seem to be nodding now. So uh, what I'm I'll do is I'll just uh, put it forward as the one motion. So I'll call the question on it as one motion. 
All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank you, Council. Moving on to item 8.9. This is uh, DNB support for provincial advocacy for climate targets. Councilor Curran, this is your report. Uh, welcome you to speak first and to uh, make your motion. Thank you. So this um, is really just um, a way um, to us to take action towards achieving our science-based um, carbon pollution targets that we set out. And it's really in um, early stages of advocacy. So I think that the, um, I'm just going to my, um, so this is a science-based approach to driving down emissions in buildings. Um, the, it has five, um, five policy asks that we're looking for support from the provincial government. I think it's really important to, um, the, the only one that um, seems to be raising some concerns is regulating GHG for existing buildings. And I just wanted to speak to that because um, we're not voting on regulations for buildings. We're um, looking for the potential for local governments um, to regulate uh, carbon pollution in buildings into the future. And just to put it in context, um, this, would be gone, this would be through a robust public process. The step code took three years of consultation before it was even enacted. So this is just um, asking for that process to begin. It certainly is not regulating carbon pollution on any uh, existing buildings at this point. Um, the, the reality is, is when you look at the modeling um, and you look at science, uh, science um, and evidence uh, based data, we will not ever be able to achieve um, our carbon pollution targets without regulations. Um, this suite of five um, working together actually gets us closer, but doesn't even achieve clean BC. Um, so I think that that should show us how much work that we have to do ahead. Um, but I, I think that some of the fear that um, I hear surrounding these things is actually doesn't, doesn't bear out. Um, this is going to be a long process. Um, to do this and looking at the work that's happening, um, for example, in Vancouver, which recognizing it does operate under its own charter, um, that all building types uh, eventually, when we get into regulating existing buildings, will not be treated the same. For example, commercial buildings, um, strata buildings, other buildings um, will not be treated the same. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, but I think that this regulation um, and the suite of these provides a critical focus and a sense of urgency that is currently lacking. And um, if you, again, look at the modeling in the report, um, it's clear that we're nowhere close to achieving them. And so I think uh, we have been talking about reducing emissions for 40 years, um, and we have been ineffective in doing that. And uh, the fracked gas from... Um, homes in BC is the equivalent of 890,000 vehicles on the road. Um, there's also health impacts, um, of course, to fracked gas that um, we don't ever talk about. So um, I hope that Council will be supportive of this. It's really just asking for us to look to um, the province for more ability to regulate. It's um, something that we would only take on as a community. Um, when and if we were ready after consultation, et cetera. So this isn't any big change happening, um, but change has to happen for us to be able to achieve our SEEP, um, which is our Community Energy Emissions Plan, which Council unanimously supported. Um, I also just wanted to point out that many of the recommendations in SEEP um, are reflected in these asks um, that we put together. So I hope Council will support this and I'm happy to answer any questions as long as I get a seconder. <laughs> is there a seconder on the motion? I second. Okay, second by Councillor Muri. Okay, uh, Councillor Muri, or sorry, Councillor Muri, you got your hand up, so go ahead. I'll make sure my volume's up. Uh, um, just, you need the microphone. There was a story like on, uh, sorry? Just closer. When you moved closer, it sounded great. Okay. Um, there was a story on uh, my favorite show, 60 Minutes, the other night, um, and Bill Gates, Anderson Cooper, was interviewing Bill Gates. Um, because Bill Gates and a group of billionaires, um, their new project is climate change. And um, 
you know, they talked about the low hanging fruit, which was, um, you know, how we build buildings better, um, more efficiently. And certainly this presentation um, tonight is going that extra step. Um, how do we deal with existing buildings? Um, and uh, how do we, you know, bring the community um, together so we're on board with um, making things better for the future. But there was a startling um, uh, bit of information in regards to the lack of um, innovation, um, but it's building and certainly Bill Gates has many companies in, that are looking at innovation when it comes to climate change. But um, one of his comments was that the development industry and industry itself, um, cement and steel, really those two industries, as far as capturing um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, they haven't even really touched it. Um, and the, 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 the startling comment uh, for me was that um, into 2060, um, 2.5 trillion, and this was an American show, 2.5 trillion square feet of development will be built um, into 2060. And the, and, the, and the example was one New York City is going to be built every month for the next 40 years. One New York City every month for the next 40 years is the type of development that is going to be built worldwide. Um, shocking. They talked about, um, you know, food sources and one of the companies that Bill Gates is um, supporting is a company that uses fungi to create um, food um, products because even if as we switch from meat to vegetables, it's still that process of trucking all of that food into these massive cities and uh, you know it has the same it, it has the same challenges with greenhouse gas emissions whether you go whether you're a meat eater um, like Mayor Little um, or a vegan um, like Councillor Curran and then those of us in the middle um, you know we may go either side um, but it's those big and you know this this motion I'm happy to support I seconded it um, you know, we can always do better as we, as we move forward and certainly address all of the things that came out of the past as best we can. Um, but it, that number and looking at those big issues are really what's astounding to me. Um, I hope that this council continues on trying to, um, you know, keep the density that it's supporting within our town centers. Um, not expanding out into um, our, uh, you know, um, single family neighborhoods um, that are reliant on the car, for example. Um, I hope that we walk the talk and certainly we've um, passed a lot more motions than the previous council in regards to the environment. So I'm encouraged. Um, but I think that big picture of what's coming is um, something that we really need to consider. And and understanding, um, you know, what uh, the outcome of 2.5 trillion square feet is really going, who, who's it really going to benefit? I think that's a question that needs to be answered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Uh, just my own comments. Um, I have some difficulties with this uh, proposal. Uh, I think that um, uh, while I've, su I've supported SEEP, I've supported uh, almost all of the um, environmental proposals that have come forward by this council uh, going forward. And, you know, do want to make sure that we're not sending um, a signal out there that, that we support forced retrofit um, on existing buildings. Uh, and, and so I have a very serious concern about that. I, I, I know it was characterized as a fear by, uh, by our, uh, uh, the report mover tonight and report creator. Um, but, uh, I think that that's, it's something I'm uncomfortable with to the point that I'm not gonna be supportive of this. Uh, I, I recognize that uh, there's going to be, uh, it's gonna be extremely hard to meet our targets uh, without that. But I think that the pressure should still be on government to incentivize retrofit, not force retrofit. 
And um, this would, if carried through, would have the ultimate effect of giving municipalities the ability to just force people to, uh, to retrofit. And I, I'd be very concerned about municipalities being given that, that, that power um, because uh, first of all, the impact is going to be um, uh, uneven. Uh, the people that are in older accommodations who are most vulnerable to the impact of a forced uh, retrofit would be the most um, uh, impacted by it. And the wealthiest people in our community who, uh, who uh, have very efficient homes, new homes, uh, they would not be equitably affected by it. And so there is a bit of a, a, a parity question here. Uh, the people who would be most impacted by forced retrofit would be the people that are most vulnerable financially in our community because they tend to live in the least efficient housing just because of the age of housing or, or other, other impacts. And so uh, I think that this would unfairly uh, impact people, whereas an incentive program uh, would tend to uh, use uh, municipal tools to be able to try to encourage people. And then we are, but we've already had that with uh, um, with rebate programs through BC Hydro for uh, moving to high efficiency uh, uh, heating sources and others. And I, and I think that that's the best way to go forward. I think uh, forced retrofit is uh, uh, very punitive to people that will be very vulnerable. And I do not want to even give the government a smidge of power in that regard. Uh, the pressure should be on us to try to find ways to incentivize people to change over at this time. And I recognize the vulnerability that puts us in in, in terms of achieving our seat targets. but. Uh, those are my comments. Can we have a Next comment up. though, um, maybe in regards to, this is a discussion, this is an encouragement in regards to looking at how we're gonna do things differently. Could could incentification not be part of that discussion? That Incentives can already change? exist now. We don't need additional powers given us to, to us by the provincial government to engage in, in incentive programs. Um, as um, Mr. Milburn has already demonstrated with some of the staff proposals that we've had in the last year. Um, so I've got Councillor Bond next. Uh, thanks, Mayor Little. Uh, I, uh, I will have a bit of a response to, to, to your comment, but I wanted to um, highlight two points and they come from our community energy emissions plan. And those points are that the greatest sources of um, emissions in our community are existing buildings yeah. and existing cars. And the, the, uh, the, contribution of any growth or development is such a tiny, tiny, tiny smidge of our emissions profile uh, going forward that really it will be impossible to meet the targets mandated by science for a healthy planet, both for our residents and more importantly, for uh, people living around the world that are going to be more severely impacted by the uh, uh, a change in climate and uh, increasing natural disasters who are less privileged than us. Um, so we have to deal with existing buildings and we have to deal with existing cars. And so I think that this proposal here that uh, Council Curran has brought forward with the uh, work that's been done by Inogo Group has you know five key asks, three of them the province is hopefully moving forward with. And I think the letters uh, that are in the recommendation uh, show our support for those three. Um, the other two uh, with respect to uh, regulating existing buildings, we it will have to be done. And I think that um, uh, to address uh, some of the concerns that that, uh, that you've raised, Mayor Little, I would be concerned about those, those things as well. Uh, an effective program designed around regulation would take those types of equity concerns into account, right? And, you know, whether that means that those who have the financial ability convert first and those without, we uh, we wait to <laughs> convert later in, in the time frame in terms of, of the transition to, uh, you know, uh, zero emissions. And we find the financial tools uh, through the support of higher levels of government to do that. Um, those are all things that we would discuss and that a, you know, a proper framework for regulation of existing building emissions would take into account to be fair and to be, um, you know, equitable for people of different financial situations in our community. So I think um, asking for that, it, it does not lead necessarily to, to that conclusion. I think that, you know, any council that um, cares about those issues that cares about, uh, you know, our, the health of our 
environment that cares about uh, human health and, and health of people around the world and the uh, you know the impacts that are being felt today uh, on people would take those things into account so uh, i'm very supportive of this i think you know the the pace financing is something that you know uh, i've heard about a lot over the past couple of years uh, it seems really interesting where you can tie the financing of uh, retrofits not to an individual but to a property um that kind of uh, you know uh, is is a longer term incentive because you know it it, it takes the it takes barriers away from people who may uh you know might not be in in the same property for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years where um those retrofits and those necessary changes to the building can be made and the benefits will accrue to whoever resides in that building over the over the time. So I think there's some really uh, great and innovative stuff in here. And I think writing the letters to get the province to support these things is 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 a crucial thing for us to do. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Uh, I've got, I'm gonna go Councillors Back and Forbes are speaking the first time. So I'm gonna go to Councillors Back and Forbes and then back to Councillor Kern, Councillor Back. Thank you, Worship. I'll make, make a brief comment. Much has been said that I agree with, uh, certainly agree with the observations that, uh, You've made uh, count your worship to some extent and, and Councillor Bond. Um, I think this is, uh, you know, we were on a path with, with in terms of how we make this a greener community and a greener future. And this is all part of it. And we're talking about important advocacy work here. I think that could help us have some big conversations that we need to have as a community. So um, I'm very supportive. I appreciate all of the background information that was included here. Um, and I think, yeah, that conversation around GHG emissions and existing buildings is going to be one that we will have to have with the community one day. And so this just kind of starts that, um, that process. So um, definitely uh, happy to support this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Worship. Um, I couldn't have said it any better than you did. A lot of the things that I wanted to say, Your Worship, um, I too uh, come away, I support, I don't think there's anybody, or I really don't believe there's anybody that's against making our environment better. Um, and I'm all in favor of that. But at the same time, um, I have the same opinion as you that this, this we passed our first GHG, um, uh, the first three items just in November. And we were promised, or we not promised, but we were told that there was no, uh, don't worry, this is just new buildings. Less than three months later, we now have another report coming to us and we're already talking about dealing with retrofitting and that feels kind of forced to me. Um, I do think this is not, I think this is a provincial and federal mandate that they should be incentivizing people to do this. I do believe the same as you is that it, it's unequal to people. Uh, the rich will be able to handle it. The poor people or the less, uh, less rich people may not be able to. And from all I've read about the PACE financing with it being tied to property, well, that sounds lovely, except that if if I go out and I spend $100,000 redoing uh, my home, it's number one gonna make it maybe less attractive to a buyer because not only am I probably asking market price, but I'm asking to for them to take on that debt. Um, so I think registering it against property is not a good idea. And so I'm back to incentivizing. Um, and I also um, did a little bit of research on all these groups that are mentioned here. And I have a bit of a problem with the process that this is going through. These reports are coming. This is a report from a counselor but there's no staff report with this. Um, I'm not an expert on any of this. I don't pretend to be, but I would like somebody who uh, knows more about it and doesn't have the same, um, same, and some, and groups that are more at arm's length. For instance, um, 
Uh, we have a council member, Council Curran, sits on the steering committee of the Climate Caucus group. And the Climate Caucus group is then involved with the, um, the Help Cities League, which is then involved with another group. So I just feel that the process here of having a report coming forward um, from a councillor without a staff report and from another organization that a councillor belongs to isn't the right process. It's almost like there's a conflict there. Um, and I think this is complicated and I think it is gonna change things. And yes, retrofitting is going to happen at some point, but it doesn't have to happen exactly at this minute. We should be pushing our governments that are higher up from us to incentivize and take this on so we can get it done ASAP. But we can't force people into having to upgrade their homes. So while I agree with the goal, I don't agree with the process and that's, yeah. I agree with the goal, but not with the process that's happening here. And I do think that councillors have to be careful about, you know, um, sitting on boards or committees of external groups and then cutting and pasting their reports as a councillor's report. Most of this report has been cut and pasted from the Help Cities Lead, where they give multiple examples of how you approach provincial government, how you uh, write a report for a council, how you, um, it's basically a cut and paste report. And so on that principle, I can't vote for this. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. I believe, uh, I don't, I'm sorry, Councillor Hanson, have you spoken already? Okay, you're a first time speaker, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I'm going to be uh, voting in favor of this um, uh, motion and I thank Councillor Kern for bringing it. Uh, whenever I uh, reflect on motions of this type, I think back to the fact that we have passed a climate emergency. We all uh, received that information and acted on it by way of uh, a vote declaring a climate emergency, recognizing the urgency of, uh, of this uh, challenge to our, our culture and our community. Uh, the steps that are called for are advocacy steps. Councillor Kern was quite clear that there's gonna be operational details, implementation details that will uh, follow should we ever be given the powers uh, that she's advocating for, but uh, these are uh, advocacy steps uh, asking the provincial government to bestow powers which would assist local governments to achieve uh, climate goals. Uh, so I I'm, uh, can very easily support this. Uh, down the road, no doubt, there's going to be uh, some very tough uh, decisions are going to have to be made from time to time, uh, but in the context of a uh, a declaration of a climate emergency. I believe these advocacy steps are uh, a logical and necessary path for us. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Curran. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, point out that all of the information is in the report. I sit on the steering committee of Climate Caucus as a volunteer. I'm um, quite pleased to spend a lot of my time doing so. Um, we are a uh, group of um, folks who are responding to the climate emergency um, at speed and scale. So to Councillor Forbes' point about uh, things coming quickly, that's because we're in a climate emergency and we need to move quickly. Um, I am pleased to say that Powell River, Fernie, Courtney, Kitimat, and Highlands um, are all very unique uh, communities in terms of geography um, and um, economies, and they have uh, been supportive of this. I think this is showing that local collective action um, can be quite impactful. And um, the equity piece, I think, is, is a very significant piece, and I would hate for this to be turned into something that it's not. Um, Vancouver, for example, is not looking at uh, purpose-built rentals at this time. 
because of the equity piece, any council would certainly look at this through an equity lens um, and incentives would need to be in place to make sure that it was um, everyone uh, was able to uh, live in buildings that were very um, safe to live in and uh, that their energy bills were actually lower. And I think that's the point of some of this. Um, Councilor Murray made a great point about embodied carbon. We're not looking at that yet, but we need to um, do that. Um, and so I think that this, I still am I'm, I'm concerned that sometimes these things get um, portrayed as something that they're not. Um, this is uh, something that would be implemented over time. Um, and the science shows that we have to move quickly. Um, we need to, we have committed as a council to reducing our emissions. Really the only two areas that municipalities have the most influence um, is transportation and buildings. Those are our top two. Um, and to Councillor Bond's point, most of them, um, most of that is already here. So um, science just says we have to move quickly. Um, there's lots of technical solutions to this. Uh, there's lots of job creation. There's lots of co-benefits to this. If we actually ever actually made the cost of um, fracking, uh, if we stopped subsidizing it, and if we counted the externalities, it would no longer be an affordable option that people profess that it is. So um, this is uh, one minor step um, that we can take. Um, and I'm pleased to see that council is um, generally supportive of it. So thanks to everyone for um, supporting this uh, at this point. Thank you, Councillor Curran. I believe Councillor Hansen, or did you already get yeah. Councillor Bond? Thanks, Marilyn. I think um, I think we might be used to staff managing our hands going down. Maybe that's not happening today. But um, I just wanted to um, I just wanted to put my full support behind um, not just this report, but Councilor Kern's um, activity on the climate change and the climate emergency file. Uh, this is, and I, I know I know from my conversations with her, and I know from my knowledge of Climate Caucus, this is uh, an, an a tremendous amount of work and it hasn't been done before and the people that are involved in that organization are locally elected fish officials who see the urgency of the climate crisis and are taking bold and necessary actions to come up with solutions specifically for local government because in the past uh, higher levels of government have not acted at the speed and the scale that is necessary. So my full support is behind Councillor Kern and her uh, uh, involvement in this. And you know, this group is supported by professionals, um, you know, leaders in the industry of uh, energy retrofits in terms of energy modeling. So this, these are professional reports that you know, if we asked our staff to do, they would probably go to the same people to get this type of report. So my full support is behind her and this motion and you know in terms of the speed and the quantity we have a goal in the next nine years to reduce our emissions by 45 percent it needs to happen now and it needs to happen fast so uh fully support this initiative and i fully support Councillor Curran's efforts on this well thank you councillor bond councillor back well councillor bond took the wind out of my sails there but i just wanted to make a comment uh and and also reiterate my support for councillor curran's motion tonight um but her greater work in this area you know some some councils are organized by portfolio and uh you know you as a councillor might be in charge of x y z issues um if our council were, was organized like that i, I certainly would see um councillor curran as our climate leader um she is doing an incredible amount of work and for a, another counselor to insinuate that there's a conflict for her uh, by being involved with organizations or groups that she's passionate about uh, and bringing those those issues forward, uh, I think it's just completely untrue. So uh, again, just want to reiterate my support. Um, I, I put my trust in Councillor Curran on these climate issues because I know she does the work. Um, and so again, uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Full disclosure, um, Councillor Curran signed me up with the Climate Caucus and Councillor Murray at the same time when we went to our very first UBCM convention in Quebec. And at that time, they didn't have the same mandate that they have now. Um, they've added, I, they haven't taken away, they've added. 
Uh, so um, I, along with Councillor Mary, are members of Climate Caucus. However, since then, I only looked upon that as a source of information concerning the environment. I'm not actively involved. I don't attend weekly meetings. And I really uh, reject anyone implying that I am criticizing Councillor Curran. What I said was I'm criticizing the process. Um, these may be some experts, but it never hurts to have two opinions. And what I didn't like was that there had, up until tonight, there'd never been an acknowledgement that Councillor Curran was on the steering committee of Climate Caucus. So I'm really glad that she's acknowledged what she does and she belongs to that. And yes, it is all volunteer time, but her paid time is to the district. And that's always, the district has always been my priority. And that's why I'm saying this feels a bit forced onto district residents. Um, I'd also like to say, when I say cut and paste, I literally mean cut and paste. And one of the cut and paste that I'm really bothered by is, is uh, on page three of her report where she says, uh, the advocacy recommended in this report would not have any impact on the financial plan for 2021. Well, that's exactly what anybody going and using this template from this group, and I'm not criticizing the group, I'm criticizing the process. That's exactly what is on their template that all the municipalities elected officials who know about this group, know about this form, know where to get templates. That's exactly what it's going to say to all of them. There's no financial impact in our 2021 budget. So that's not actually a researched statement. We're just doing our budget now and there is an impact on our budget. Mary, well, can I respond to that, please? Can I finish, Sorry. please, Councillor Kerr? That's the, that's the floor. Um, there you is a second a time speaker. You are a second time speaker, so you're pretty much out of time. So can you just wrap up, please? I was just going to say there is an impact. And if you look at our current budget right now, we've we've established a climate uh, uh, climate. Uh, division within the DNV, and that's costing money. So there is an impact to our budget. And I don't like the process of just cutting and pasting that because it doesn't apply. It is affecting our budget. And um, like I said, and people have twisted my words, I voted for the climate emergency that we were in a climate emergency crisis, but now we're getting into details that we're being asked to vote on. So I still stand by voting for that we're in a climate emergency crisis, but I think we need to just take a look at who's responsible for what and what we can do. And if my timeline doesn't agree with your timeline, well, it's still an emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stewart, do you have a comment? Yeah, Your Worship, I just want to be very clear about um, we have repurposed an environmental group to be more focused. We've reallocated staff. We're not adding staff at this point. Uh, as we work with council on a mandate, uh, we'll have those conversations. But at this point, uh, we are merely reallocating resources within the organization to be more focused on the policy direction that council is providing us uh, with this regard. And I would just add, a, I guess, a second point. This is, this is going to be sending letters to people at the end of the day. What the senior level of government do with those letters, we'll find out. And then we'll have an opportunity as an organization to say what's right for our council. We're just merely, I think, the recommendation here is trying to shape this to say that we want the ability to do things that we can't do right now without senior level government authorization. Yeah, and so just my second time speaking, I, I think downplaying the, uh, uh, the purpose of this, we must retrofit existing buildings to reduce overall energy. That's a forced retrofit that that's referring to because you could do an incentivized voluntary retrofit already. 
um, regulating GHG of existing buildings. This would include development of new regulation that would set greenhouse gas emissions targets for existing buildings. Uh, you know, th this is all designed to be a forced retrofit. Now, there are other reasons why I'd have some challenges with a forced retrofit. Um, and I, I, again, I'm saying, I think we, we should be applying pressure to create incentivization programs province-wide to be able to reduce uh, 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 the, um, uh, the GHGs of, of buildings in, in our province. Um, but uh, if the retrofit cost becomes so high for buildings, all you're gonna do is see a massive increase in deconstruction waste going into our, into our landfills. Um, and I get that there's, there's an energy benefit, but there's also negatives to this. This is, um, uh, it, it's not just a clear cut case of, of decreasing GHG and, and everything's rosy. There's a lot of negative impacts to forcing reconstruction projects and, and retrofits on existing buildings. And I get that uh, that that may be a step down the road, but there is no question that supporting this report is supporting the provincial government giving that power to municipalities. And that's what I don't support. This should be province-wide. This should be an incentive program, not a forced retrofit program. And so my challenge is, is, is very specific to that. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not supportive of this. We're not always going to support everything. And just because we supported the climate emergency doesn't mean that we still don't consider and weigh options um, as they come forward to the council. And so that's, that's my view. Uh, there's no way to read this report and not say that it's suggesting we should lead to a forced retrofit program, and, uh, which I, I reject. So um, that is my... Uh, comment on the matter. And so just looking at the list, I see Councillor Muri a second time. Oh, is that a third time, Councillor Muri? No, just a second, second time. time. Okay. I, I was just going to ask, though, I mean, are we not writing letters? I mean, you know, advocacy um, can be presented in all sorts of different forms. Um, we're saying to the provincial government, um, look at this. It doesn't mean that they are going to agree um, with you know, your um, perspective, Mayor Little, in regards to forced retrofits. Um, there, it could be incentivized. This is uh, one position um, that has been taken. Um, it is open for discussion, is it not? Mr. Stewart? <laughs> your, your, your Worship, um, and, and, to, and to Council, there's nothing in the motion that suggests that there's going to be forced retrofits. What they suggests is that we need to do retrofits of existing buildings to achieve our it? goals, and so we could easily put in the report to the to the to the province or whoever that uh, concerns were raised about a uh, forced retrofits for those who could not afford that, and the need to provide incentive programs. And I, I'm, I'm taking from this discussion and debate that that's a really important issue that we in, in North Vancouver need to be able to to, to say. But I, I don't think, and I'm going to go back to Councillor Bond's comments, in order in North Vancouver, with all the single family homes that we have, there will need to be an evolution that is not going to involve rebuilding homes so much as retrofitting them. And as to how we do that is a matter of, of policy discussion. I, I don't know that there's a question about the need to do it. Sorry, Mr. Stewart. It's a question of what we want to achieve and how we can do that. Sorry, Mr. Stewart, we're at 1029. I have to interject. Council, I need a motion so to move beyond 1030. Moved by Councilor Miri, second by Councilor Bond. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Meeting is extended. Mr. Stewart. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I've made my point. I, I think we can include in the letter that there are concerns about forced financial hardship on existing homeowners that we need to reinforce that the, the public policy needs to take that into consideration. But we ought not to lose sight of the fact that, and I, I, I saw a paper today, that uh, there, there's no question that as older homes uh, have to give up their furnaces because the furnaces are gone, you know. And, uh, and I mean, I'm in the same boat in, in, in my home. I expect in the next five years, my furnace is it's, it's 40 years old now, is going to die and it's going to be expensive. But at the same time, if we can, if we can offer inducements through senior levels of government, not necessarily local levels of government, to uh, make those kinds of changes 
so that people can achieve those goals. And I, you know, I, I just want to make that that difference that by merely sending a letter to the province saying giving a, giving us the authority does not exclude the opportunity to make a very sound argument for how we do that. It's not what we want to do; it's how we do it. And I think that's a fair comment. I, I appreciate you making the effort to bring me in, but I'm still concerned about municipalities having the power. So. Can I also ask the question in regards to um, this being province-wide versus individual municipalities? It, it doesn't make sense to me that it's individual municipalities. It Not absolutely it. does need to be province-wide. So um, are, we, are we asking the province to consider that or are we just looking after our own interests? Um, I understand the other two mun municipalities are considering this as well. I think that's a question to you, Councillor Curran. Do you have a response to that? Um, yeah, I think everything we want to do, we want it to be globally. Uh, we want everyone to take action, but the the this would allow municipalities that are able to move more quickly to move more quickly. Um, and but I think the equity piece to Mr. Stewart's points has to be considered. And and there's also advocacy, Councillor Mary, on the provincial level as well. Um, but there's no evidence if you look at Clean BC, which is what the province's plan is that they can get there without the municipalities doing this, um, without the municipalities um, driving down their emissions. So obviously we always want it to be um, provincial, federal, international, but we also need to be empowered to move quickly at the local government level. We are the level of government that is able, that is responding um, at speed and scale. So I think this allows us to continue to show leadership. So it's, it's, I mean, we are asking to show leadership and we are wanting to be responsible in regards to our, um, our climate emergency. Um, but we also have to look at all of the impacts um, that are going to be um, put at the doorstep as Mayor Little has, has brought up and Councillor Forbes has brought up some concerns as well in regards to, you know, not everybody's in the same boat. Not everybody has the same financial ability. So if there's, I think Councillor Bond said that there's, you know, we will be, you know, there is an opportunity to look at that incentivization. There is an opportunity to look at, um, you know, requiring certain things to be um, considered over time. But all of those questions have to be answered um, in some form. And what is that, what is that process, Mr. Stewart? Uh, Mr. Stewart, well, you your worship, um, I, I can tell you from history, uh, having written literally hundreds of letters to the province, <laughs> the province will do what the province wants to do. And um, we will react to what the problem, what authority the province gives us, and then have to decide as a municipality, uh, more importantly, better on the North Shore as a community, to what we can support. Mm -hmm. uh, but not writing the letter is to just leave it to the province. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not reinforce the fact that there is a role in local government, but we do need to be working in partnership with the senior levels of government. So this is really, in, in my perspective, I mean, I could be very cynical and say, beware of what you ask for, because you might get it, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have to deal with it. Yep. And that's the truth of it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, right now it's completely out of our hands, mm -hmm. to a large degree. And... So if there are municipalities that are prepared to make changes and, and to introduce uh, opportunities, whatever those might be, subject to any kind of a caveat, this is really saying we're communicating merely to the province that we think municipalities have a, have a role to play here. Let's work with us. And what role it, that is, is to be determined. Ab absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I see no further speakers. So I'm gonna call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed with uh, myself and Councillor Forbes opposed. And does that match your record, Mr. Clark? That's correct, Your Worship. Okay, thank you very much. Council, that was the last piece of business on our regular report. And uh, so I will just say, are there any, uh, the only report I would make is I know we, we mentioned something before the meeting, but we do have on Wednesday, uh, we have anti-bullying day and a number of people on council are wearing their pink in recognition of that. It's something that uh, I know the schools will be a big partner of this week. And 
Uh, so it's good to see support uh, from, from the council on that. Uh, so any urgent reports, uh, Mr. Stewart? Just one quick uh, mention, Your Worship. <clears throat> we are, are working with uh, Metro uh, Vancouver to improve the alarm system associated with the dam. And I just want the community to know that. And it will be reporting out publicly as that, uh, that initiative progresses. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Back, you had your hand up. Your, uh, that, you were covering anti-bullying day or? <laughs> that was at Your Worship, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, yeah, good, thank you. Okay, thank you all so much. Uh, have a great week, although I think we have Tuesday night uh, workshop tomorrow night uh, for uh, the next step along the process for our uh, uh, review of our official community plan. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.